distinguished speakers, experts, and dear participants. Good afternoon and namaste. Welcome to a special discussion on 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Before we start, let me briefly introduce NICE. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, a political, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. China Studies is one of the major research centers at NICE. China Studies as a whole brings into perspective the rising powers mounting economic, military, and diplomatic clout that certainly has the aptitude to either overturn or sustain the current contemporary world order. The center broadly examines China's international strategic thinking and conduct, foreign and security policy, and the impact of domestic politics and economy on China's foreign relations. We have been holding regular interaction on China with experts from around the world. We all are aware that 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party is being held in Beijing, opening on 16th October 2022, with around 3,000 de around 2,300 delegates of the Chinese Communist Party the party which has more than 90 million members. These delegates range from top provincial officials and military officers to professionals across sectors, including farmers, industrial workers, uh, around which 25% are women and 11% come from ethnic minorities. It is expected that the National Congress will pave way for Chinese President Xi Jinping to get elected for his third term. Some even claims that he might be elected as the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, not the general secretary, the title that has not been used after 1982. The 20th National Congress is different than those in the past, and it has raised lots of questions and curiosities. The rise of China and China being important factor in South Asia, Nepal, India, and the region is concerned about those developments. It is in this context We'd like to request our eminent panel to make their remarks in eight, maximum 10 minutes. Uh, what can ex uh, be based on what we can expect from 20th National Congress and how it will impact India and China, in, uh, India and Nepal in particular, and South Asia in general. Some of the major questions for today might be, how do we look at India, China, and Nepal, China relations during the third term of President Xi Jinping? What changes can we expect at the Chinese Communist Party in days to come after the 20th National Congress? Also briefly touch upon how Xi Jinping is going to engage with the United States and other regional and global powers in days to come. Please make your remarks within a stipulated time, that is eight to 10 minutes, so that we can have some time for discussions. Question and answers session will be after all the speakers have made their remarks. And this is an academic discussion. So a speaker will speak in an open forum without any protocol precedence. We are following the convenience of the speaker and the time zone as well. The program is streaming live on our Facebook. Please do share the link on our social media so that Maxim can benefit from this discussion. First, we'd like to request Ambassador Asok K. Khan. Ambassador Asok Khan joined as Director of Institute of China Studies, Delhi on 31st March 2017, a career diplomat, Kant was ambassador to India to China, ambassador of India to China until January 2016. Prior to this, he was Secretary East at Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi, with responsibility of about 65 countries in India's extended neighborhood. His previous assignments include High Commissioner of India to Sri Lanka and Malaysia, Council General in Hong Kong, Deputy Chief of Mission in Kathmandu, and Joint Secretary East Asia and Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, India. Earlier, Khan served in different capacities as, as Indian mission in Singapore, China and US, and at headquarters in New Delhi. In his diplomatic career spanning over 38 years, he has specialized in Asian affairs with a particular focus on China. Apart from three assignments in China, he served as Joint Secretary East Asia as Director and Minister of External Affairs China for a period of four years, closely involved in the formulation and implementation of India's foreign policy in the rest of China and East Asia. He has an advanced certificate in Chinese language from National University of Singapore. He joined Indian Foreign Service in 1977. And Mr. Kant, welcome once again to our program and over to you, sir. Thank you. 
please unmute sir please unmute yourself okay yes, we can hear you now. Uh, yeah uh, thanks for that introduction uh, let me come you know straight to to some of the issues you have raised and uh, you made this query about how 20th party congress will start this sunday and last for about a week uh, is different from earlier party congresses uh, uh, i would like to mention here that uh, the context in which uh, the 20th party congress is being convened is quite significantly different from uh, the 19th party congress which took place in october uh, 2019 for one thing uh, you know we have uh, a question mark about the future trajectory of the rise of china how exactly it will proceed and unexpected events at home and abroad have complicated the path to the 20th party congress and here i'll very quickly mention uh, you know three factors one the chinese economy is facing serious headwinds with uh, world bank projection for growth rate in 2022 being 2.8% now as compared to target of 5.5% and this this is due to a variety of reasons including certain policy preferences of xi jinping uh, secondly you know xi jinping's zero covid policy is creating disruptions and anxieties on a fairly large scale and thirdly the geopolitical environment has become more challenging for china post ukraine war as apprehensions about china have increased in the usa european union japan and the developed world in general so it continues to hold its own in the global south where there is re reluctance to take sides in the sino us strategic competition despite these difficulties uh, xi jinping is seen to be comfortably placed to achieve his main objectives at the 20th party congress why do i say that once again i have very quickly i'll mention uh, three four factors one over last 10 years xi jinping has proved to be a transformative leader who has uh, completely upturned the norm of collective leadership and emerged as a supreme leader he has remade the party state and he dominates this process of change uh, secondly uh, through removal of term limit for presidency in march 2018 he had telegraphed his intention to seek a third term and possibly continue beyond three terms and there is no sign at present of his leadership being challenged seriously or any anti xi coalition coalescing though he has antagonized a large number of people in the party hierarchy three in the ideological space he established his dominance through successive steps including the designation as the core of the leadership in 2016 a inclusion of xi jinping thought on socialism with chinese characteristic for a new era in the party constitution 2017 his elevation in the pantheon of chinese leaders next only to mao zedong in the third party history resolution at the sixth plenum of of the cpc 19th uh, central committee in uh, november 2021 and so on so today xi jinping controls ideological commanding heights in a manner which is difficult to challenge and finally you know he has uh, tweaked the process for selection of members of central committee making it a top down model uh, dominated by him and also reduced the role of seniors significantly now very quickly i'll i'll refer to three aspects of the outcomes of party congress uh, one personnel uh, two amendment to constitutions of the cpc and three likely policy outcomes in all likelihood uh, xi jinping will get a third term as supreme leader uh, whether as the general secretary which is more likely or chairman as uh, pramod mentioned but uh, on that there is not much doubt being expressed at present uh, secondly he likes to secure a favorable composition of the politburo politburo standing committee and other leading organs uh, already in fact uh, he has put in place uh, uh, people close to him in various you know party and uh, state positions uh, which shows you no know, kind of composition that will emerge out of the 20th party congress uh, and as i mentioned earlier uh, you know uh, you know in terms of ideological commanding heights of both uh, party and state uh, he will he, he is likely to reinforce his position uh, we don't expect uh, 
a successor to be identified uh, for uh, Xi Jinping. The uh, rest of the leadership lineup uh, is difficult to predict uh, given the you know, kind of opacity we have in the Chinese system, but there'll be greater representation of technocrats in leadership positions, uh, something which is going on for some time under Xi Jinping. Coming to amendments to party constitution, uh, it is being speculated uh, that you know, Xi Jinping thought uh, uh, you know, for uh, you know, uh, it, it will be you know the it's a fairly you know uh, quite quite a mouthful. Xi Jinping thought for socialism in a new with Chinese characters in a new era will be sort of made into something pithier like Xi Jinping thought, uh, are more in line with Mao Zedong thought. Uh, secondly, you know the idea of two establishments, uh, uh, which refers to establishing. Uh, Xi Jinping's status as China's core leader and establishing his political uh, doctrine, uh, which is enshrined in party's constitution 2017, uh, may be incorporated as part of the CPC constitution. And there are some other possible changes which are being debated. Coming to policies, uh, uh, after getting his third term, Xi Jinping will be pursuing his legacy. We may not see any radical course correction in response to geopolitical and economic headwinds China is facing today. Because, you know, many of uh, developments are linked to very conscious policy choices uh, Xi Jinping has made. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, China will continue to seek to achieve its second centenary goal of great rejuvenation of Chinese nation, which includes uh, emerging as the preeminent power, China emerging as the preeminent power displacing the USA. Uh, it will also pursue its uh, unilaterally defined core interests and territorial claims, uh, including vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Taiwan, uh, South China Sea, East China Sea, and along India-China borders in a, in a rather uh, coercive manner. Domestically, uh, Xi Jinping's preference for greater emphasis on ideology, preeminence of the party, a greater role for the state sector, restraints on the private sector, selective decoupling to reduce dependence on the West, and a more inward-looking approach uh, will continue uh, as far as uh, we can assess. But uh, we'll see greater focus on specific initiatives like common prosperity, global development in initiative, uh, uh, global security initiative, uh, hardening of position of Taiwan, uh, uh, greater focus on national security and so on. But you know, these will be more in terms of incremental changes rather, rather than shift in policy positions. And finally, you know, uh, it seems unlikely that uh, contrary to speculation, some quarters, uh, China will exit zero COVID policy after the party Congress. Uh, that's not likely to happen in a hurry for a variety of reasons that we can discuss uh, uh, later. Uh, let me conclude here by saying that uh, the scenario which is likely to emerge out of uh, the 20 party Congress uh, in terms of personnel, in terms of uh, uh, changes to CPC constitution, in terms of uh, policy approach, uh, uh, will not make any big change in the larger picture as far as South Asia or you know, countries like India and Nepal are concerned. Because we'll see continuation of the present trends with some shift in emphasis, as I mentioned earlier. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Khan, for your remark. May I now invite Professor B.R. Deepak. Uh, Professor B.R. Deepak is Professor of Chinese and China Studies at Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He's a recipient of many scholarship and awards, including the prestigious Nehru and Asia Fellow and India-China Ex Cultural Exchange Fellow for his doctorate and advanced studies in the Chinese Academy of Social Science and Peking University, Beijing. He is the author of India and China, 1904 to 2004, A Century of Peace and Conflict, published in 2005, India-China Relations in First Half of the 21st, 20th Century, in, published in 2001, China, Agriculture, Countryside and Peasantry, published in 2010, Chinese poetry from 11th century BC to 14th century AD, for which he won Chinese Special Book Award in 2011. 
India-China relations, civilization perspective, India-China relation, future perspective, and several others. Professor Deepak has been a visiting fellow at the University of Edinburgh, UK, and Chinese Academy of Social Science, Beijing, China, and has delivered lectures at several universities around the world, including Free University Berlin, Bonn University, University of Heidelberg, Shanghai Academy of Social Science, Beijing Foreign Studies, University, Sichuan University, and several others. Professor Deepak, over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, uh, Pramod, uh, with much uh, ado, let me sit, uh, uh, go to the topic. Uh, if uh, I may use uh, my Chinese phraseology in order to uh, 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 show what I uh, read out of uh, the 19th, uh, 20th Party Congress, uh, I think first it is going to be Renmi Lingxiu, so that is people's uh, leader. As uh, far as uh, economy is concerned, it's going to Renmi Jingji. Uh, people's economy. Uh, as far as uh, foreign policy is concerned, I think it will remain Tarko, uh, Baijiao, great power diplomacy. And as far as uh, India-China uh, you know, uh, relationship is concerned, or India's place in China's uh, foreign policy is concerned, uh, though it won't be reflected in the uh, party document, but still, since you have asked us to flag it out, I think it still remains uh, Xiao Kaindu. So that is continue to belittle India. So these are four uh, things uh, uh, I flag out first. And uh, in terms of uh, people's leader, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, it is all about like Chi Shema Chitri, so Shema Lucia. So what banners to hold and what road to tread. And I think it is going to be all the way uh, you know, banner and line of Xi Jinping's thought, which uh, was eloquently elaborated by Ambassador Kant. And uh, with this, uh, you know, the two more things uh, would be affirmed, or uh, in Chinese, they call it Liang Weihu or Liang Chueli. So that means to safeguard the core uh, leadership of the Communist Party of China, which of course is uh, Xi Jinping. And the second is again uh, to safeguard uh, the uh, thought, uh, Xi Jinping thought, as uh, Ambassador Kang uh, has already said that it uh, may be included in the party charter, which uh, they are uh, doing it right now. You know, from uh, ninth they have started, and the seventh plenum uh, would be concluded on twelfth. Uh, uh, as far as execution of this. Uh, uh, banner and line paradigm is concerned. Of course, uh, he would uh, place his loyalist, whether it is the Central Committee uh, 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 or the uh, Politburo uh, or the uh, Standing Committee, especially you know, uh, the, uh, the, the last two uh, Politburo, uh, which consists of 25. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping already has uh, 12 of his men there. Uh, perhaps uh, more uh, from uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, loyalist uh, from Fujian, so Zhejiang, Shanghai, Party School, and Shanxi Council, Ningxia. These are the area where Xi, Jin Xi Jinping has served uh, you know, all these uh, years. And most likely, uh, according to my uh, uh, speculation or reading, uh, it is going to be Fujian click all the way into the uh, uh, Central Party Committee and uh, Standing Committee, you know, to some extent. Standing Committee less because if we follow the convention, then of course only two people, perhaps Ding Xue Xiang and uh, uh, Li Chang, or uh, uh, you can say Huang Kunming, so these are possibilities. But, you know, at this point in time, perhaps it would be too early to uh, conclude. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the 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 uh, this Jiang uh, Xiangpu Pian so that means uh, no one would be allowed to change the color of the uh, mountains and rivers of China. So I think it is meant uh, to warn his detractor, especially those you know who wish to try a different line, implying that uh, the campaigns. Uh, uh, this tiger and flies campaign, it will continue and perhaps in order to execute in a better way, uh, uh, the tautology, it will give 
uh, give way to uh, you know one of the Xi, Xi Jinping's loyalists in the standing uh, committee, and uh, he would be taking control of the CCDI. Uh, this is also an indication to perhaps the foreign forces, perhaps the West, West as such, because these are the people who have not shown mutual respect for China's path, a theory, and system, as Xi Jinping has reiterated it all the time. As far as uh, people's economy is concerned, uh, I think most of uh, the issues have been flagged out by, uh, by Ambassador Kant. I would just uh, uh, you know, add to this that, of course, if you look at the numbers that China has done tremendously well, uh, China's GDP has been doubled uh, when it took mantle in 2012 from 8.5 to almost $18 trillion. And that is also uh, uh, we need to take into account its poverty alleviation uh, program. Uh, but again, that is a contradiction. And I think this contradiction will continue, which was again flagged out during the 19th Party Congress, that is unbalanced and inadequate development. So this contradiction will continue to play. And uh, when, uh, uh, Li Keqiang has also you know, uh, emphasized that uh, over 600 million Chinese people, so they, 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 uh, uh, the, the, their uh, monthly income is not more than 1,000 yuan. And it has also been revealed by the Chinese official figures that 0.14% of the Chinese elite, they account for almost 33% of the Chinese wealth. Uh, another thing which is perhaps uh, 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 important is uh, uh, the kind of uh, investment China is to make uh, uh, in the infrastructure, including real estate uh, sector, almost 45% of it is to go to in these sectors. So now since uh, real estate sector is in shambles, so I think uh, the kind of returns they used to have and the related or ancillary industries uh, in real estate, so that will not be there. So we see uh, a slowdown as has been projected by uh, the uh, World Bank. And another thing is a uh, recent phenomenon of uh, uh, yuan depreciation that would also create trouble for uh, Chinese economy to some extent. Uh, it has uh, registered 12% depreciation this year alone. So the confidence uh, of the foreign investor that I think to some extent would also be shaken. And China's total GDP, as they have been talking about it all the time, it would also be impacted. As regards foreign policy, though, it won't be clearly mentioned in the party document, but I think uh, the framework, so it will continue to be, uh, be, be, be that, and that is the framework of uh, two pillars of China's uh, foreign diplomacy. So one is building uh, a community with a shared future for mankind, as a body and uh, uh, the new type of relationship as the second pillar. And of course, the second, it has two flanks, that of uh, major power relationship and uh, the relationship with developing country, mostly the BRI, which will include you know, uh, all these countries in Southeast Asia and even South Asia. Um, so I think uh, 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 since uh, the, the new type of relationship, it demands you know, uh, mutual respect, uh, equality, win-win cooperation, especially to the first uh, West has been reluctant to recognize that. Uh, therefore, this ideological confrontation or debate, it will continue. And finally, as regards uh, uh, its uh, equations with India, and I think uh, this uh, competition continuum, it is going to be played at regional and even global level. With this, uh, I thank you all for your patience. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor B.R. Deepak, thank you for your remarks. May I invite uh, Ambassador Leela Mani Podil. Uh, Ambassador Leela Mani Podil served 32 years in different uh, public positions. Uh, formerly, he served as uh, the Chief of Secretary of Government of Nepal, Nepalese Ambassador to China, Secretary at the Office of Prime Minister and the Council of Ministers, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of, Ex Ministry of Information and Communication, and the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, and Civil Aviation. He has served as Council General of Nepal to Lhasa for China, 
Currently, he's engaged in social activities, including cleanup campaign of rivers, uh, talk shows at different occasions and all. He holds master's degree in business administration from Tripura University, Kathmandu. And he has been showing general interest in philanthropy, traveling, yoga, and meditation. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Pramodzi. Can you hear me? It's OK? Sound? Yes, sir. We can hear you clear. OK. Thank you, Pramodji, for organizing this uh, program and inviting me to share some of my views. Um, uh, first of all, let me uh, directly go to the uh, subject matter. The 20th People's Congress is uh, being held uh, in such a time period, which is uh, significantly uh, different than the previous one, that, that was 1927. As earliest speakers also highlighted, I would like to flag on those uh, points uh, once again. In uh, 2017, uh, when the 90th Congress was being held, at that time, um, and the people were speculating about the uh, leaderships. And the, uh, although there were uh, some speculation that the Xi Jinping uh, will uh, um, get some sort of the amendment in, your, in, in, the, in the party constitution, uh, for the continuation of its uh, third term. Uh, but uh, there was a uh, lot of speculations that uh, who is going to be uh, uh, elected or selected as a, as a leader, top leaders, including the party standing committee and central committee and, and, the, and the Politburo. Uh, but this time, um, uh, this debate is not there in the, in the, in the platform. I, in, uh, we, we, uh, can pretty uh, predict that the Xi Jinping will have the third term uh, without any any challenge, uh, without any obstacles and hurdles. Uh, uh, this uh, ground has already been prepared uh, from the uh, previous uh, party congress by amending party constitution and the later on in the in the, um, uh, uh, the uh, government's constitution as well in the uh, People's Congress uh, held after that. Um, therefore, that uh, the, the National People uh, Party Congress uh, has uh, two mandates, basically. One is to select leadership. And then selecting leadership is uh, quite plain at this time. Although uh, there will be an election for the 204 member, uh, very powerful uh, uh, party central committee members uh, who will elect the uh, Standing committee as well as the um, party political bureau and uh, and the and the select the leaderships, but uh, particularly uh, uh, leading party uh, from the top as a party secretary general or probably as a chairman, that is quite clear that President Xi Jinping will have no contestant as or other other contestant as well is there. Um, um, that is the leadership selections, but uh, considering the uh, the um, country's overall um, picture scenario and the and the international scenario it is significantly different. Uh, first, uh, um, since 2017, now the global uh, um, politics has been uh, significantly um, uh, become strenuous and the and the divided, polarized and the uh, conflicts are abound, and the, uh, even that there is a war, the Russia and Ukraine are in war. There is no sign of uh, immediate uh, um, that conclusion of that uh, war or the immediate sign of stoppage of any war. And then still there is a very uh, speculations are there, would, there would be a threat of, of being a, a war converted into nuclear war or the third world war. Um, that's why the global scenario is highly volatile. And the um, China's uh, um, um, relationship with the, with the uh, uh, developed world, particularly first world, um, is uh, much more intense, much more uh, frictions are there, and then intensified their um, uh, um, kinds of the conflicts is intensified significantly intensified than the 2017-19 Congress time. Um, uh, uh, there was a trade embargo after the 2017 uh, uh, 
Congress, uh, 2019, uh, 19th uh, Party Congress, the restrictions on China's investment on technologies, banning on China's critical supply, in uh, critical input uh, material supply of materials like microchips and uh, uh, to Chinese industries and restriction on Chinese using technology like that 5G, even that uh, detention of the high officials of tech firm uh, to humiliate and harass China's investors uh, globally, that has taken place after the 2017's, uh, 2017's party Congress. Um, uh, particularly the uh, Western countries, the developed world, uh, the China bashing is going on, unabated. Uh, they are like that there was a Hong Kong uh, um, um, uh, in a kind of a, a rift and a riots last year. And the uh, Taiwan provocation is going on continuously. The recent uh, very senior officials visited, US officials visited Taiwan and the further instigating the, provocating the, the, uh, the uh, strenuous relationship uh, between West and China on the issue of Taiwan. And the Xinjiang issue is continuously uh, putting on, uh, on platform. Very, very recently, the Western countries are trying to um, um, uh, uh, defame China using that Xinjiang issue. And the Tibet law was passed uh, uh, a couple of years back. And then that was, uh, China has been uh, uh, claiming that it is a blatant uh, uh, intrusion on China's internal matters. That has their human rights cards and the, China debt trap propaganda that has that has been rising, and the COVID nineteen pandemic has also exposed the lapses of Bretton Woods development uh, model, particularly the most powerful countries uh, who has the world class uh, health facilities, even the personnel and resources, everything they had, but they were not been able to protect their people's life and the maintain the supplies of critical um, life saving essentials. Uh, during the pandemic. And the, um, this has exposed the weaknesses of that development model. And the uh, China has been more relatively able to control COVID pandemic with, uh, with uh, a lesser extent of, of impact and, and the losses. Although there are anxieties and the people's uh, some sort of apprehensions even uh, for the zero COVID tolerance policy and the uh, people are obsessed with the, with the too much uh, testing and uh, and the and the um, hassles because of the uh, COVID zero COVID policies uh, introduced by the China, but uh, China has been able to uh, uh, control COVID pandemic with relatively uh, lesser losses. That has uh, uh, um, uh, given a, a privilege of to claim that uh, China's uh, governance system is more robust. Uh, in case of emergencies and, and uh, pandemic period. And the is China is more capable of saving its people's life. That can be uh, uh, an strength for the, for the present Chinese leaderships to uh, um, uh, convey the, 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 the party Congress at this time. Um, uh, uh, so as uh, uh, Professor Conta mentioned that uh, the Conflict uh, between the West or the developed world uh, has been increasing with China, and the, uh, they are not being able to easily reconcile the possibilities of being supplanted uh, in global leadership by China by uh, global leaderships. Um, that's why this tension is uh, not going to uh, be eased uh, as as early or as quickly as possible. Uh, these are the challenges for China. And the another domestic challenge is that although China's uh, GDP has uh, more than 60% uh, up uh, compared to the previous party Congress, uh, from uh, 12 billion US dollar to 12 trillion US dollar to now the 18, uh, 19 even, yeah, 2022. And that's why it is uh, um, significantly uh, grown despite of all embargoes and the, um, and the, uh, restrictions on investment and the restrictions on supply of critical materials for the uh, tech giants and the um, technical uh, embargo on, on China. Um, and despite COVID-19 pandemic even. 
And the, the, uh, what are the challenges are there that China's growth factor, uh, growth, uh, GDP growth has been significantly declined and uh, which is not sufficient enough to, um, um, to, to uh, create uh, uh, jobs, opportunities and, the, and the, um, satisfy the uh, growing the middle class people. Um, very large number of middle class people created by the uh, continuous growth of uh, um, economy in the last 40 years. And the, uh, apart from that, uh, the, in, in 19th People Congress, President Xi Jinping has mentioned in his policy statement that uh, the growing development need and the, and the disparity between the, um, uh, the rich and poor, these are uh, the economic challenges. That challenges are uh, uh, continuously posing uh, uh, kinds of the uh, um, risk of, of, of uh, being the, uh, the economic policy being different than the, what the uh, Western's uh, Bretton Woods model of economic development is, is pursuing since last 77 decades. And China has to show that its uh, economic policies are more just, more equitable, uh, uh, and the, uh, is uh, as, uh, uh, delivering the expectations of the, of the uh, bottom of people. And the China has been able to also eliminate uh, the abject poverty, but the growing in inequality is there. These are the uh, um, challenges for the uh, President Xi Jinping to address in the, in the uh, coming period. And the, um, um, ideologically, uh, he is uncontested. Uh, he, uh, his policy of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics already already been enshrined in the already been incorporated in the in the uh, party constitution as well as the uh, government's constitution. Um, that's why the his uh, leadership uh, um, um, you know, through the policy is unchallenged and the uncontested. Um, he will uh, continue command uh, as a as a um, ideological leader uh, to the party, um, but uh, the, that he has to realize uh, the the uh, uh, two goals that uh, um, internally um, the eliminate the I mean that the reduce the gaps between rich and poor, and the uh, uplift the uh, uplifting the. Uh, 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 very large number of um, uh, abject poor people out of poverty trap. Um, that was a great achievement, but uh, the sustaining that is also equally challenging. And then not only sustaining, continuously uh, boosting their incomes uh, and the uh, reducing the gap between the bottom strata of the people and the higher equivalent people is a, is, a, is a big challenge. And he has to continuously pursue that uh, uh, policy through his uh, co uh, kind of a cohesive leadership uh, that may be selected uh, in the in the forthcoming uh, party congress, and the internationally he has been uh, uh, basically articulating three uh, um, uh, three policy uh, paradigms, particularly uh, global security uh, initiatives and global development initiatives, and the third one is the uh, community of shared future for mankind. Um, and this has to, uh, he has to work together with the developing world, including India and Nepal, and the other, other developing world, African countries and uh, South Asian countries, and the, uh, in the, in, in kinds of the conflict, their kind of growing conflict with, with the, uh, um, the uh, first world, particularly the developed world. Um, I'm talking about the its implication on, uh, in South Asia, uh, particular talking about Nepal. Um, he has been, uh, since he was in power, he has been continuously uh, giving uh, priority to the neighborhood. And the, uh, for Nepal, he has given uh, a lot of uh, interest and emphasis on the Nepal's socioeconomic transformation and trans Himalayan multi-dimensional connectivity network. That, uh, that uh, development framework has been agreed uh, during his, his tenure. And uh, he, uh, his uh, neighborhood uh, friendly policies uh, uh, has uh, um, a lot of uh, of um, minds made development opportunities for the country like Nepal uh, in its uh, uh, socio-economic development and uh, cultural aspects. Particularly, uh, global uh, security initiatives he has proposed um, uh, that is a collective security of of the countries in in the globe and the region as well. That's why Nepal also um, need to. Um, 
uh, uh, pin down its 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 uh, uh, interest on particularly on the security fronts. That is, the Nepal has no any any uh, any any security alliances with any other countries, but uh, there are certain uh, core interest uh, security interest of our neighboring countries, and the Nepal has to uh, particularly sensitive enough and uh, to avoid of engaging on any kinds of the activities and that will kinds of the jeopardize or the infringe the uh, uh, core security interest of our neighbors, both the neighbors, uh, that applies China as well. And the, on that uh, front, and the Nepal has to uh, close work closely together with China. And the uh, uh, our uh, uh, cooperation particularly will be focused on, on development aspect. And the China has been, uh, his foreign policy will be not much paradigm shift, particularly regarding the neighborhood policies um, about uh, India and China, Nepal. Um, I think uh, he will continue to pursue uh, uh, friendly policies and then ease out the tensions with India um, uh, because of the growing uh, uh, in, uh, differences with the, with the Western walls. Um, and the, it depends upon the how that uh, both the countries will be able to uh, mend their differences, uh, particularly the border issues. Um, as my, in my understanding, President Xi Jinping is continuously uh, pursuing the matters with India that the, our border uh, issues are uh, uh, no way to resolve in short term. That's why let us put it in as it is condition and then continue to uh, enhance cooperation on, on economic front and development uh, cooperations. That is what uh, he has been, I, I, I think he's pursuing. That's why the, the several rounds of the uh, bilateral um, summit meetings were held uh, until 2017 and then I think in the third term, uh, it will uh, uh, reopen the avenues for, for cooperation with India, and that will significantly benefit Nepal. If there is any kinds of the conflicts uh, or the tensions between India and China, and uh, that will be detrimental for Nepal's development and the security as, as well. Though Nepal uh, cannot uh, uh, involve in any side in that, in, in that scenario, but uh, that uh, spillover impacts would be tremendously large for Nepal, for a country. That's why Nepal will always be aspiring for the good relationship between two our neighbors. And also will be uh, uh, playing a positive role for, uh, for a better relationship between China and India. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to um, flag on, on two or three issues. First, domestically, um, uh, China, uh, Xi Jinping's leadership is uh, um, uh, definitely very strong and then is required for the uh, global challenges and domestic challenges uh, that China is facing at this moment. And the, um, uh, and the leadership, he will select, uh, the, maybe the party central committee will select the political bureau and, and the standing committee would be much more cohesive. But he has to uh, manage the if there are in some differences within the within within the party committees, and then he has to manage those differences uh, very uh, um, um, skillfully, uh, so that uh, they can uh, unitedly uh, uh, face the challenges the China is facing at this moment. And the, these are very large challenges, and then the stakes are going beyond China's territory. Uh, any kinds of the uh, um, of the arms skirmishes with the United States of America and China would be uh, uh, disastrous for entire humanity, and that would be the most uh, dangerous uh, um, uh, for the for most danger for the for the entire uh, human civilization and world. And then to avoid that kinds of things, and continuously uh, pursue the policy of dialogue continue the policy of, of uh, uh, resolving differences through the uh, through the dialogues rather than the, uh, uh, the the any kinds of the arms skirmishes that would be the uh, aspiring uh, that would be the aspirations for the people like nepal and the us uh, for the development cooperation uh, when the president xi jinping is uh, proposing the uh, a community of shared future for mankind that is for the more just and uh, equitable global order. The, we have been witness the seven decades of the Bretton Woods uh, led uh, development model that has put the developing countries more vulnerable like Nepal. 
that's why uh, the the what the Xi Jinping has been proposing for the community of shared future and the uh, global de uh, development initiatives and the BRI like that uh, platforms. We, we expect that uh, such policies uh, would uh, bring in more opportunities for a country like Nepal, um, uh, socio-political transformation and uh, um, uh, uh, solving people's, uh, uh, resolving people's aspirations for a better life. Um, with this, I would like to say thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Lila Manipodal, for your remark. May I now invite Dr. Ritu Sammanik Tiwari. Uh, Dr. Tiwari teaches at the Department of Political Science, Sahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi, and is currently an honorary fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies in New Delhi. She has been a student editor of China Report, and she holds PhD in Chinese Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She was the recipient of the Visiting Fellow Program of Young Sinologist in 2017, awarded by the Ministry of Culture, People's Republic of China, and the Chinese Academy of Social Science, Beijing. She was earlier awarded the International Visitor Leadership Program by the Department of State, United States in 2016, and Pavet Fellowship at the Politics and International Studies Department, University of Cambridge, UK in 2013. She was a visiting scholar at the Shanghai Academy of Social Science, Shanghai in 2012, and a visiting researcher at German Institute of Global and Area Studies, Hamburg in 2009. Dr. Tiwari, over to you and please uh, be brief, like on seven to eight minutes because we're running out of time so that we can have some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod, and uh, thank you for having me on this platform for this discussion. I'll uh, try to focus on one specific question, which is uh, factional politics, notwithstanding what would be the composition and character of new Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, the Politburo is a self-perpetuating committee. Uh, it is it is a kind of amaranthine entity with new members of the Politburo and Polit uh, Standing Committee being chosen by the internal consultation between active Politburo members and retiring PSC members. So the National Congress formally elects pre-selected member in a sense. And uh, the implication of the composition of this top leadership is very crucial in terms of decision-making bodies uh, because it demonstrates the political influence that she will continue to have and along with his allies will continue to wield. And how much of the support does the president enjoy on certain viewpoints, uh, such as preferences for stronger state intervention in the economy, is very contingent upon the com com composition of this uh, particular uh, Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, so if we see according to the seven up eight down uh, convention that has been followed since 2002, um, we know that the age gap, the, the gap, uh, the age, uh, partic particular reappointment at age 68 years or older cannot uh, 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 be given and uh, one cannot retire before 67. So if we follow that kind of a seven up, eight down formula, uh, we know that despite the presence of many factions in the current Politburo Standing Committee, uh, the four PSC members, Lee Ke Chiang, who's 67 years, uh, Wang Yang, who's 67, uh, Wang Haneng, who's 67, and then Chao Li Che, who's 65, should continue if this kind of a norm is followed. And uh, uh, the uh, the other two who's uh, like Li uh, Chanshu and Han Shang, who are 72 and 68 uh, uh, respectively, they should retire, which would basically empty up to Politburo Standing Committee uh, positions. Now, the two members who are most likely to come to those two empty positions is uh, Hu Chanhua and uh, Chan Minor, uh, who are basically most qualified in terms of uh, their equation with different factions, as well as the fact that they have a lot of work experience um, to hold these uh, uh, positions. But at the same time, we know that there are other front runners. And uh, 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 for instance, Liu He, who's another member of the current PB, who heads the uh, center government's financial stability committee, he's also a front runner. So one is, so the question really is, will she increase the number in the PSC to accommodate more of his own? Will the current number of seven be uh, you know increased to um, say nine because there have been two experiments in the past in terms of PSC membership in 2002 the membership was increased from uh, seven positions to nine and in 2012 it was decreased from nine to seven and uh, that kind of a readjustment has been done in the size of Polit Bureau Standing Committee uh, given the fact uh, given given the kind of situation that China would face uh, internally as well as to miss uh, externally. So um, in my reckoning, a status quo of seven members is likely to kind of continue at this particular juncture, uh, even though it would mean that half of the 
polit bureau committee uh, standing committee would actually be made up of uh, the other faction other than the uh, faction of xi jinping which is the thuan pai uh, wang yang li kachiang and who if they are retained in the polit bureau standing committee and only two apparent xi allies chao wen chan so uh, this kind of a, a composition would retain if there is a, a stance in favor of stability and a stance in favor of status quo in in terms of how the composition of uh, psc is maintained and if she follows this kind of a norm based composition it would uh, represent a very significant political uh, uh, you know aspect of the current uh, uh, congress it would represent a, a limit to the personal power that she can wield actually despite the fact that he's about to continue for a third historic term uh, and it would be important it would give a very significant uh, uh, messaging because this would mean that stability is being uh, prioritized in the face of any ailing economy antagonistic relations as the previous speakers have um, pointed out antagonistic relations with major powers and with also with other regional powers and also a strict zero covid policy all of these have kind of created a very isolationist stance around china so maybe if stability is a priority uh, a status quoist composition of politburo standing committee is a likely outcome of the congress um and of the so, se, of the potential seven members that we have just uh, kind of discussed uh, at least wang yang li kachiang and chan and who have a pro market reform orientation so the amplification of their voice is also possible as mr kantha earlier pointed out if many technocrats enter a broader central committee now uh, whether this kind of an amplification will happen is something which cannot yet be uh, surmised but um, one thing that is very sure is even if a st status quoist possibility of politburo standing committee is envisaged she is hold on party is unlikely to loosen uh, even though political stability remains the key word because of this very premise uh, and because of the fact that there is an uncertainty around in in terms of economy in terms of external relations uh, the supreme leadership of she is going to rise above the collective leadership of the politburo standing committee and uh, we have seen through various uh, campaigns we have seen the way a uh, party has been propositioning she centrality in all of its uh, propaganda in all of its uh, uh, you know uh, ideas about how to go uh, how to go ahead with uh, facing these challenges um the party has been working over time in fact to highlight she's legacy and leadership status and they have established him with at par with actually the party elders mao zedong and tang xiaoping uh and uh, if we look at how it's happening in terms of uh, the media for instance uh, china's uh, dynamic decade series is airing on the state run uh, daily china daily newspaper also people's daily uh, xinhua news agency and uh, the cc uh, cctv they have all been uh, broadcasting a new series called navigating china that celebrates the advancement and policy achievements made under xi jinping's direction so that kind of a highlighting of xi centrality is very much in place uh, even if the status quo of the politburo standing committee is maintained um other big appointment that one is uh, trying to kind of watch out for is uh, who is going to be the next premier li kan li kachiang has declined to serve another term as the state uh, council's premier um and which gives way for she to appoint a close ally as the next premier even though none of the she's apparent pb allies have any kind of prerequisite experience in that sense uh and who chen hua who is again a front runner for that particular post uh, who's also one of the possible two possible replacements uh, for psc um uh, is there despite that uh, option being available she may just prefer to uh, bring in the elderly wang rather than who uh, because then that would mean that you don't really initially bring in a very you know relatively younger charismatic leader so in such a scenario uh, the two new members who if given entry in uh, the politburo standing committee who and chan they may be positioned as the future leader for 2027 or 28 um however she may prefer to keep a door open for a fourth term for himself in which case party is unlikely to resolve the uh, succession issue at this particular uh, national congress and uh, as a result we might see a uh, ensuing uh, potential successors as rivals in the in the course of next four four years so um and finally i'll uh, 
end with this particular point. What could be the takeaways for the region and also the world from this particular party congress? In the context of foreign affairs, again, I'll focus on the way you know composition is being readjusted. Uh, Yang Chiechi, the director of the party's Central Committee Foreign Affairs Office, is widely expected to retire. And uh, Liu Chiayi and Wang Yi are the two likely candidates for this post. And out of these two, if you look at Wang Yi, he supports a tougher foreign policy stance. Uh, Liu Chiayi, on the other hand, is seen as close to the agendas of global governance, uh, reform, and also deterring China's independence. So irrespective of either of them entering into the PSC, she's a great power diplomacy, as has been a point made by earlier Ashok Kantha, uh, Ambassador Kantha, and also Professor uh, Deepak. Uh, great power diplomacy uh, has made the existence of these bodies lose some of their relevance. Uh, China has been pushing Xi's economic, political, uh, digital security models through, as uh, pointed out by Professor Deepak, the BRI, uh, also the Global Development Initiative, the Global Data Security initiative, uh, global security initiative. So all of these initiatives have kind of for, brought to forefront Xi's, uh, you know, uh, vision of economic, political, digital security models. Uh, the US-China trade wars is likely to continue under Xi Jinping's next term as well, uh, because the issues that have been responsible for it will continue. For instance, US uh, export restrictions on China or uh, the ban on Huawei and other Chinese companies working on 5G technologies, such as the ZTE, etc. The supply chain issue, uh, which arose in the wake of pandemic, all of these are because they are going to continue, they're going to continue well into Xi's next term as well. Uh, while China's reputation has suffered in the West and also to an extent in the region, uh, growing middle powers and smaller countries still see China as a, a very important bulwark for any kind of economic recovery post pandemic. Uh, given that kind of an expectation from China, um, I think the task for the new uh, PSC and also Xi Jinping is going to be uh, difficult because I have a feeling that most of their attention is going to be focused on domestic issues. Uh, so domestic issues are likely to take precedence over any kind of external, uh, uh, you know, uh, new objectives. So in that sense, external uh, relations and uh, foreign policy of China is also going to kind of follow the status quo that it has till now. I'll rest with that and I'll maybe expect more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tiwari. May I now invite Mr. M. B. Rapai. Mr. M. B. Rapai is a security analyst based in Delhi, focusing uh, on Asia's strategic issues. Rapai is currently affiliated with the Institute of China Studies in New Delhi and is actively publishing chapters in books and articles at reputed magazines and publications, uh, magazines and newspapers. He has published articles in The Diplomatist, The Wire, The Hindustan Times, focusing on Chinese affairs. Additionally, he has also published a book called China's Military Reform, published in 2017. He previously worked with the Ministry of Defense, Government of India, and worked as a research fellow at IDSA from 1996 to 2005, 2002. Arapai is well-versed with Mandarin language. So over to you. Yeah, thank you, Pramod. Thank you, uh, you and your institute for making me a participant to the esteemed panel. I think I will not repeat what the other panel members, uh, rather I will try to not to repeat because a lot of things have said. But uh, I think two or three things I will, for the, the, your original question, what is the difference of the 20th uh, People's or the Party Congress? When I looked at uh, the previous ones, uh, two things, I think the ideologically of course, we, we talked a lot about Xi Jinping, but ideologically the change has been, there, there is a continuity, but there is a change. Uh, Mao Zedong was dealing with the, the Marxism in a more, or, uh, it's the pattern which applied to the workers and peasants, and he adopted those things to China. But I'm seeing uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, China is trying to reorient itself to the modern technology and the developments. A lot of uh, the supply ch chains, was, um, I think 30, 40 years back, nobody would have thought of this sort of supply chains and uh, production methods. So that, how the China is orienting the entire Chinese population to this new ideological thinking, uh, despite all their internal 
squabbles and other things. Um, by and large, the majority of population uh, and the Communist Party is still with the leadership and the communist ideology. Uh, I think in this process, two or three groups have lost out. That is the workers and the women representation. In this party Congress has come down. Uh, I don't have the numbers, so I'm not getting into the numbers. But, uh, uh, but one new constituency which has come out is the, uh, the technocrats, not only technocrats, the, the investment bankers and other uh, decision makers. And uh, how their contribution to the new developments is going to change that we need to watch closely. For example, I think as you are aware, uh, broadly this uh, 2,926 members elected for the uh, party Congress is coming out of 38 constituencies. That out of that 38, 31 is the provinces and uh, uh, larger uh, administrative uh, divisions of China. But the seven, rest of the seven is very interesting. Uh, it includes the PLA and uh, the People's uh, Armed Police and uh, technocrats, uh, as I re referred er earlier, the investment bankers uh, and the major economic decision makers. So this combination and how they are going to be distributed or how they are going to uh, assert their power that we need to understand and how that is going to affect the future uh, plans of Chinese Communist Party and China itself. Uh, and uh, I think I will mention two more things about uh, uh, economic decision making because recently I saw a study. Uh, so Liu He is likely to retire because due to his age and uh, the likely replacement may be Han Wen Xiu and uh, Her Li Ping. Uh, so what will be there? Um, there may not be uh, no dramatic changes in the economic policy, but how they are going to adjust to the new changes. Uh, they are seeing the uh, tough competition from the West, uh, the ongoing uh, Ukraine war, and uh, at the same time, managing the, uh, the larger supply chains. And Taiwan, I think Taiwan is very crucial. It is not only because I think we get a lot of information, uh, media blitz about the security issues, but Taiwan and China is economically also very closely linked, investment and technology. So how that is going to develop and manage, uh, that is that we need to understand and uh, look seriously into that. Uh, so uh, I think I will talk a little more about PLA. PLA, it is very interesting what is happening in PLA. Uh, PLA, for the last 10 years, a lot of things have changed. Uh, they, from the, their uh, military regions to, they moved to the theater command, uh, theater, uh, theater commands. Now China is managed by five theater commands. Of course, the integration and joinness have to work a lot more. Uh, so how that party is going to uh, manage that is to be seen. But the likely leadership of the PLA, that uh, who will be the members in the PB and uh, who will take over as uh, defense minister and chief of staff, uh, I think those details I'm not getting into, but uh, the four likely people who are uh, to be key to this succession is General Lin Xiangyang. He is the Eastern Theater Command right now. And uh, their focus on uh, Taiwan and uh, that Eastern Theater will continue. Then the next is uh, General Liu Chanli, who is PLA Ground Forces Chief. Uh, Admiral Miao Hua, who is a political work department specialist. So PLA's political work and how that is um, going to continue at the uh, same time support the larger policies, but at the same time also try to uh, keep the um, uh, ideological purity or ideological thinking, which uh, brought up in the traditional way in the PLA and how that relates to the people on the ground. So these things we need 
more evidence and more uh, clarifications. And the fourth one is General Chang Shangmin. He is a, a Discipline Inspection Commission member of the CMC. And uh, so how this four people and the rest, uh, I, I don't expect any dramatic changes in the PLA structure or the PLA this thing in the coming five years, but uh, how much corrections they can bring upon and uh, how the PLA is oriented and how PLA is more closely linked to the domestic issues. Uh, because I think after all the, the uh, apart from the uh, occasional eruptions in the Taiwan, China is going to still look at the, its domestic issues and domestic security very seriously because uh, regarding the international issues, uh, I don't expect a confrontation with US at this stage of the things because it, both the parties know that it takes a lot of uh, problem for both of them. Uh, and uh, uh, practically speaking, China know it has limitations in uh, nuclear capabilities and delivery mechanisms. So China will not provoke such a confrontation unless something goes dra drastically wrong. Uh, and I don't expect that. Of course, the solution to uh, Ukraine war, everybody, it is in everybody's interest uh, because Europe in general, the people started suffering due to the, uh, their livelihoods has become uh, the living expenditures has gone up. Uh, so that is, Leaving that aside, uh, China has to play an important role um, in the coming years. And uh, the economic um, supply chain, the, the product supply chain still, uh, depending upon East Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, China. So the, how that uh, the, the new leadership is going to manage that, that we need to watch and uh, Hopefully, for all the people, uh, they can manage it well. Uh, of course, there will be competition. Uh, when I speak that uh, managing this, it doesn't mean the, uh, the, there will not be competition. The competition in the field of uh, uh, 5G or 6G, those things are going to go on continuously. And therefore, there will be, you, you see, there will be some upheavals in the market and uh, um, the technical regimes. But uh, coming back to the party congress, the uh, Ritusha was talking about uh, only two changes, but I don't know the Politburo Standing Committee. Li Keqiang, as he has already clarified that he will not stand for a third term in the as premier. Uh, more likely that he may leave the uh, his Politburo Standing Committee membership also. So then who will be replacing that? That we have to see. And uh, uh, the overall policy, overall economic well-being and uh, the, the global development uh, uh, program and the global initiatives uh, Xi Jinping is talking about. But till now, we haven't seen any serious thinking and the serious work behind that. Uh, and I don't think that, that they are in a mode to immediately confront anybody in the international system or replace the uh, existing uh, structures with their own because they are not ready for it. But that will that is a future project. And uh, let us see for uh, in relation to India and Nepal, um, I think earlier the ambassadors have spoken, so I will not repeat what they said, but I'm not expecting any dramatic changes. But India have to manage its relation with China because this is a very key relation. I always say that uh, you may choose your friends, but you cannot choose your neighbors. That is a given. So uh, we have to deal with China as our largest neighbor. And uh, at, in the meantime, our economy is still linked with a lot of products um, uh, we source from China and our uh, supply chains are still linked. So for example, the pharmaceuticals or, the, or other key sectors. So we have to continue to work with them. 
and uh, the overall policy of the party, how much changes it will bring in. Apart from replacing the, uh, uh, it is obvious now that uh, Xi Jinping is likely to get his third term, but uh, what will be the succession process? Of course, it may not be immediately visible, but I think before the 21st Congress, we may get some clues about it because they cannot continue with this system. Uh, and uh, another thing I will uh, try to say that he may be, he is very acceptable leader and all that, uh, but whatever the media we get, but, but he cannot replace Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong's status in Chinese history will remain uh, in a different position. So how much he can assert his position and how he can uh, put in place a succession pattern or the uh, success of the party, that is to be watched. I think I will stop here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I will take more questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapai. May I now invite Dr. Bhavana Singh? Dr. Bhavana Singh is a consultant at Ministry of External Affairs, India. Previously, she was program ad advisor at MACOS MD Healthcare, Noida, and former associate fellow at Center for Air Power Studies, New Delhi, and worked with McKinsey and company and others. She is also former senior research officer at the China Research Program at the Institute of Peace and Country Studies, and holds PhD from Chinese division in the Center for East Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Her work focuses on China's nationalism and China's foreign policy with regard to US, Japan, and South Korea. She has published, she was nominated to the Taiwan Study Camp for Future Leaders from South Asia in 2010 and have participated in several seminars and conferences in China. She has authored for the book, China's Discursive Nationalism, Contending Its Softer Realms, which was published by Pentagon Press, New Delhi. Over to you, Dr. Singh. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod. Um, uh, I would rather start uh, at the risk of repeating from the previous uh, speakers. Uh, I would delineate some differences, um, but rather largely major continuities uh, that are visible from the 19th Party Congress. Uh, at the 1940 Congress, 204 full and 176 alternate members were chosen to the Central Committee, um, who were elected amongst 2,287 delegates. The Central Committee was reshuffled uh, during the 1940 Congress uh, to accommodate Xi Jinping's allies. And anybody and everybody opposing his uh, uh, party line was uh, done away with, for instance, Sun. Uh, Chang Shai, who, who was shunted uh, for having violated party discipline. So in this uh, sense, uh, there, um, the, uh, there is a continuity under Xi Jinping where uh, there is a, a trend of cultivating patron-client relationship. And most of his, uh, his uh, uh, co-workers, co-delegates uh, have been uh, nominated from Herpei, Huqian, che, uh, Chechiang, and Shanghai, where he had previously worked. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, even in the 20th Party Congress, it is expected that uh, largely Xi Jinping's uh, clique will dominate. Uh, the party in the Xi Jinping has shown uh, increasingly less tolerance for factionalism. Uh, most of the parallel power centers uh, like the uh, uh, Ling, like Ling Chi Hua and Hu Jintao's clique, along with the CYL, has been uh, marginalized. Uh, the 20th Party, uh, 20th National Party Congress is, however, special given the complex set of external and internal pressures that China faces today. Uh, I would delineate four, four or five of them here. First is its relationship to the U.S. because uh, uh, because of its relationship to the U.S., China has been seen to uh, 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 China's opinions in the uh, international arena are seen to be more precipitate, precipitously negative. Uh, second is its the rising tensions in the Taiwan Strait, though uh, China is unlikely to go for the military option unless and until it feels strong enough to take on the US. Uh, so, uh, but there's still going to be uh, an attempt to unite uh, uh, the 
island uh, since there is a particular timeline that Xi Jinping has set for himself in terms of national renewal. So uh, there are some rumors that uh, Xi Jinping is likely to uh, try and acquire Taiwan by 2027, since that would be a very uh, uh, particular, very significant stage in his uh, reign as a president. But uh, um, the, mil uh, the military option can easily be ruled out due to intervention from US. Uh, third is the growing frustration over China's zero COVID policy. Uh, uh, COVID has not only dampened the spirit of achieving the Chinese dream by the, uh, the by the set date of 2021, when uh, at the centenary of CPC, they had uh, wanted to in, uh, wanted to kind of say that China has literally arrived. But uh, COVID has been a dampener in this spirit, though it has affected almost uh, the entire uh, globe uh, at the same level. But still, uh, since uh, um, Xi Jinping had uh, almost given up the dictum of biding its time and uh, announced China's foreign policy for at the forefront. Uh, so you can see that uh, there is a growing frustration uh, in, in the domestic arena over its zero COVID policy. Uh, fourth is the stalling economy. Rural employment is at an all-time high and there have been business have shut down and uh, the uh, supply chains have been disrupted uh, at a uh, huge level. So there is a rising, uh, uh, there is, the economic growth has also been hit and it is on, the World Bank has predicted that uh, in the coming uh, year, uh, uh, the Chinese growth can be scaled down from 5% to anywhere between 2.8 to 4.6 this year. So there is a huge uh, uh, dent which has been made to uh, the Chinese economy due to COVID. And the fifth is the Ukraine factor. Uh, though this is uh, outside of domestic uh, uh, issues, but uh, the Ukraine is, uh, the Ukraine factor is important in the sense of China, Chinese relationship with Russia, because so far China had looked for, towards Russia for imitating how the uh, how not to let the CPC down. They had uh, intensely studied. Uh, how the fall of the Soviet Union to avoid the mistake that had led to uh, Soviet Union's downfall. Uh, and in this sense, you, they, uh, they have, uh, 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 they have in, in fact requested the international community to come, come in favor of uh, Ukraine and not, uh, uh, not allowing Russia to continue its war there. So uh, the, the relationship with Russia can be seen uh, 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 the, there might be some frictions there as far as China's relationship with Russia is concerned. So these four or five factors are going to define uh, how he presents his uh, policies at the uh, 19th party, uh, at the 20th party Congress. There could be, uh, an, there could be uh, an uh, emphasis on ideology and there could be a lot of invocation of history to serve the present as the agent and I will continue to be party disciplined. Uh, Xi Jinping's rise had been basically, uh, uh, it ha he had written on the uh, uh, anti-corruption drive and to achieve the four comprehensives of uh, uh, well-off society, deepening reforms, promoting rule of law and, and enforcing strict party discipline. But uh, these have been now uh, uh, stalled to a, a certain level because those who have been asking for reforms and there is a a uh, certain faction which has actually said that reforms are very, very necessary at this point of time. But Xi Jinping has had to uh, silence them and some of them have actually disappeared from the front uh, because uh, uh, reforms do not seem uh, a plausible uh, a way to go about uh, re, uh, 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 replenishing the economy that has uh, been uh, that has been disrupted by COVID. Uh, however, he continues to determine to push his uh, reforms in terms of common prosperity. Uh, uh, it's not exactly clear as to what this means, but uh, they have not decided to dispossess the rich of their property or the landowners from uh, contributing uh, uh, in a major way. But this would largely mean uh, that uh, uh, Xi Jinping had set uh, a, a poverty elevation and uh, uh, um, basically giving a larger scope for play to the uh, masses of uh, masses in China. So uh, uh, in terms of foreign policy, I think we could 
see a more assertive China in uh, uh, in response to how uh, China's rise has been stalled because uh, BRI was his uh, uh, pet project, but uh, there has there is rising uh, setback in BRI and uh, most of the countries that had actually uh, signed in uh, on the member uh, MOUs in uh, for uh, uh, agreeing to the project have actually backtracked. And uh, as far as most of the uh, countries in China's neighborhood are concerned, they are actually asking for uh, grants and aid instead of uh, instead of China giving them loans. So uh, the, uh, the BRI is facing a huge backlash uh, in terms of uh, uh, being, uh, despite being Xi Jinping's pet project. And there are now speculations that uh, the BRI is uh, somehow being overhauled under the Global Development Initiative. Uh, so uh, it, it would be kind of a remolding as well as uh, somehow drawing attention away from the BRI uh, to be able to uh, place China in a better uh, position as far as uh, global uh, pro uh, development is concerned. However, there are uh, certain uh, um, uh, trend reversals that can be expected as far as the Politburo is concerned. Uh, they could retain the num seven, num the number of seven, or uh, there could be an increase in the Politburo members. Uh, if there is a, uh, if there is an increase, it could indicate loosening of Xi Jinping's control over the Politburo to accommodate uh, China's uh, 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 China's uh, impending uh, 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 necessities. But if there is a uh, retraction of the Politburo, which means if it is uh, cut down to four of uh, four or five, it could in fact mean that Xi Jinping is gaining more control over the Politburo. So this is one trend that could be uh, uh, outlined right now. Uh, secondly, the uh, party elders' influence is seem to be dwindling, uh, even though there were a few instances in the media that uh, the party elders kind of rebuked Xi Jinping for the, uh, for the uh, backlash that China is now facing. Uh, one uh, particular instance was Xu Changrun, a law professional uh, at the Tsinghua University in Beijing, took a big risk in denouncing Xi's hardline policies and revival of communist orthodoxies because uh, the, they feel that there is a general anxiety in the population and there is a sense of panic, uh, which has led to criticism at home. And there is there are some criticism also at, on uh, WeChat groups and uh, in the local media. Uh, though there has been attempt to silence them as well. Uh, uh, she, uh, the, uh, there is also backlash against Xi's foreign policy as, with respect to the US as, the, as there is a per perception that China could have avoided confrontation with Trump and uh, much of economic disruption could have been avoided. Uh, there are three important uh, 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 measures to look forward to in the 20th Party Congress. First would be the structural changes uh, 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 even though Xi Jinping is likely to retain his loyalists. Second would be the uh, new policy agenda, which he might set in his work report. And third would be the personal changes that he will highlight. Uh, however, there are certain lapses uh, that can be identified. For example, uh, China had uh, uh, set the target of uh, uh, reaching uh, of achieving national rejuvenation by the year 2021, which was supposed to be the centenary of the TPC. So uh, the big task in front of Xi Jinping now is how he manages to build the consensus uh, about his policies uh, and uh, try and avoid discussion on the lapses that have happened uh, despite uh, giving his best. Uh, as far as the question of succession is concerned, I think it's best to leave it to posterity because uh, uh, Tang Xiaoping was not exactly uh, chosen by Mao, and uh, Xi Jinping was himself a surprise candidate. And I don't think uh, uh, he is in a mood to uh, uh, announce a successor, uh, since he intends to uh, 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 intends to uh, strengthen his control over the Politburo. I think I would rest with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, for your remarks, may I now invite Dr. Prasant Kumar Singh. Dr. Prasant Kumar Singh uh, is a research fellow at the uh, at Institute of Defense Study and Analysis. He is also a keen follower of state and society in Taiwan, and he keeps deep interest in 
India's engagement with East Asia. Uh, his current, uh, he has obtained a PhD and MPhil degree uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And he's a recipient of prestigious CCS grant for foreign scholars in 2016 by National Central Library Taiwan, Taiwan Fellowship in 2014, and National EU Enrichment Scholarship of Taiwan from 2011 and 2012. Dr. Singh has been invited to speak at renowned institutes, including Tsinghua Institute of Economic Research, National Central Library, National Teaching University, and several others. Uh, Dr. Singh, over to you. Thank you, Pramod. Thank you so much for inviting me, but uh, just a necessary correction. Uh, I am associate fellow at IDSA, uh, still not research fellow. So just, but that doesn't matter. So I will, uh, Pramod, I will, just uh, build my uh, presentation around your, your questions, which you have said, which you have sent to uh, to us. So, your with regard to your question, how this twentieth national congress is different from the previous ones? Yeah, it is. It is quite different. It, the difference is in the context, in the context and the backdrop. This uh, congress, this congress is taking place. Interna international geopolitical co context with reference to the ongoing uh, war in U in Europe, in the Ukraine war. And uh, of course, then overall this COVID situation, which the world is still exiting from, uh, from, from it. And then uh, things that have happened that have happened around the Chinese uh, periphery with reference to the Taiwan, Taiwan Strait, and also uh, the well-known incidents in the Himalayas in last uh, two years between uh, India and China. So th that context is making it somewhat uh, different. It is also different than we are going to see and in the recent history of last uh, 30 or 40 years that uh, the, the president uh, continuing for the third term, general secretary continuing the further third term. It's a basically we are maybe we are going to witness in all likelihood the reiteration and reaffirmation of the undisputed lead leadership of Xi, Xi, Jinping. Xi Jinping. And this is also uh, somewhat different because we are going to witness exactly what is the state of collective leadership in uh, China now, basically with reference to what other esteemed fellow speakers have referred, pointed out towards the uh, composition, the likely composition of the Politburo Standing Committee. So that competition may perhaps tell us the, the present state of collective leadership in the Communist Party of China. And then there is an issue then uh, that it is also notable that the successor is, issue is still not resolved. It is yet uh, it is unresolved yet. And there are all indicators by going the indications available in the, in the international media that Xi Jinping is unlikely to indicate or point out or give any indication towards uh, uh, his, his successor. And maybe that may be a consideration behind uh, the uh, composition of Politburo standing, uh, Politburo standing Committee. Because uh, as we are gleaning through now, through whatever is being published, that perhaps uh, his main consideration will be not to indicate anyone the, uh, the successor, but let's see how it plays out. So the successor uh, issue is, is still unresolved. So that is, that is making this uh, this particular Congress uh, uh, quite uh, quite different, uh, quite different. And I agree that still, however powerful uh, and powerful Xi Jinping may be, and however uh, however strong desire he may have to be known. As on as in the league of Mao Zedong, he is still not Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong and other leaders of his generations, Tang Xiaoping and others, they created, they founded the People's Republic of China, and it is always difficult for anyone, not only in the Chinese system, in any system, political system in the worldwide, to outsize or to outgrow the founding fathers. And the, the China is China is still known by Mao Zedong and. His colleagues, and the and the more more importantly, what we saw, the President Xi Jinping is still operating through the alleys and corridors of institutions, and we exactly and and the party establishment. We do not know whether he is capable enough 
even though it is a theoretical and hypothetical question to approach operate outside the outside the outside the party channels whether he can uh, he, whether he can arouse mass fervor and, and mass sentiments by issuing direct call to the masses the way mao mao zedong did even tang shaoping had had significant capabilities to operate outside the party channels so on that count we are not very um, one is not very sure i am not uh, very very sure and still i would not like to rate him as mother mao zedong is equal and i think many chinese would not like to do so either uh, but uh, and another point is regarding the, the, the culture which rapai sahab uh, uh, raised it's yeah this that a cultural turn basically china had started taking the early 1980s onwards and the ruling discourse now which we are seeing it is difficult to accept it as a marx as a scientific socialist discourse as a marxist discourse we are as we used to say we the, the world was during the mao era mao era those days the discourse was basically He built and and revolved revolved around the the principles of working class struggle and workers worker workers issue, but once the China started opening up in the late 1970s and 80s, we also see that perhaps not perhaps it is very well suggest way of talking that it started looking for alternative source of uh, alternative ideological sources of. Uh, uh, legitimacy to rule, and uh, Chiang Zemin's the three uh, three represents Sangka Tai Piao was basically uh, a turn, a turning point in this regard. And after that, whether we can th there may be debate, but still a question can be raised whether the Communist Party of China is truly a, is only a um, working class party or it's a party of overwhelming majority of the Chinese people or encompassing every everybody. So. That way, that way, the that the turn has been already taken. But I would say that that now that quest basically for finding an an alternative source of ideology and an alternative ideological source to to rule has taken uh, basically I should say a very defining defining point under 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 Xi under Xi Jinping. President Xi Jinping still pays court to. Oh, Marxism, Leninism, and Mao. Oh, but he breathes culture in his articulations. He breathes uh, Con Confucius. He breathes virtues of Ch 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 virtues of uh, traditional Chinese cultures. He breathes basically, and he much he debunks exceptionalism. His entire political and uh, other articulations appear uh, deeply steeped in his belief, as we can. Make through his writings in inherent goodness and greatness of uh, greatness of uh, greatness of China, and now these are core socialist values, core socialist values defined in terms more in terms of uh, basically China's traditional culture, which are which have become building blocks of new ide ideology in China. So that way, I, I completely agree. Rapai Sam knows it well, but he didn't press this point further. I am pressing it further that. Uh, Ideological caste in China has has substan substantially changed. In, um, has substantially changed. Uh, substantially changed, and maybe now we see a uh, we have seen last ten years a cultural nationalist China, and this trend will continue under President Xi's uh, third term. Xi Jinping's basically uh, this uh, ideological and political agenda will continue. The Chinese dream, as defined uh, as defined by him. Will continue, and we will see this in his party building exercises. This we 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 will see in his state building exercises, either through the, the imposing political discipline, which he which he has the which he has done remarkably successfully in la, last ten years. But we will see it further because this agenda, because if the these documents, the 19th Party Congress report, Xi Jinping's cent centenary speech in July 2021, and the third resolution on party history in November 2021, are any indicators? Then these indicators do not leave any doubt about China's ideological direction, uh, ideological and political direction under President Xi Jinping. 
and his own his own ambition in in ideological basically in ideological terms that what kind of china he wants to see and what kind of role and legacy for himself he he visualizes in that china so the ideological and political direction will remain uh, unchanged unchanged and maybe if i if you allow me you to use some liberal phraseology that uh, i fear and many fear the a totalitarian slide maybe because it even a totalitarian slide though this this is still a fear but the kind of uh, the direction ideological direction which we have seen in last um, uh, 10 years and the political dis disciplining of the even society we have noticed so these fears are there in some mind whether it will happen or not that is different different thing it will depend on depend, depend on lots of thing intensity and degrees will depend on lots of thing but the direction is is is, is very clear direction is very direction is very clear and xi jinping is going to this 20th party congress with a very impressive report card and no doubt on economic terms xi jinping so we we can highlight the the recent hiccups basically the covid 19 induced hiccups in chinese economy but the longer trajectory of 10 years is really very very impressive and particularly when we look at this how this 100 million there were 100 million people people living in absolute poverty in, in 2012 and now there are only 1.1 million it is very impressive and there are other indicators like disposable income which has gone more than double in 10 years and gdp has also gone more, more than double and fdi fdi is also 35 billion dollar more than what it was in 2012 and now china has emerged as a leading ofdi provider and it is providing more ofdi than it is receiving a receiving fdi receiving fdi receive and at present the latest figure is around 153 billion dollar and the trade now the as per the the latest figures china's overall trade is 6 billion dollar dollar more than the american overall overall trade and urbanization rate in terms of permanent residents has significantly improved in china so these are not mean basically achievements under 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 sit in thing and but yeah the recent problems are there so now the issue is this what has made sit in thing so popular and so so successful so so popular in the public in the party so i will sum simply sum up in these three words that he has provided a basic socialist stability in china there is no doubt about it. he has cleansed and he has restored a credibility of china so the credibility of the communist party of china in 2012 you you will recall that the dominant discourse was the coming collapse of the party under the weight of corruption that corruption had hollowed out the party and and the party was uh, party days were numbered that was the discourse now who talks of that party is prestigious party is again again credible party is again and party is very popular as as we as we read in the literature the party is very popular among the youths in the universities in the colleges and the recruitment and join the joining rate of the party has gone up the the, the students and youth are believing that they are believing and that whether they that uh, the, that uh, the for coming many for coming many many years and decades the party will be with them when they need it that is their basically feeling that what were happened that's a different thing but those are the, so that that is, that is his achievement that party he has made it so the the party had always had this concern about its perennial rule sustainability of perennial rule by and the, the and the coming existential crisis and he has removed that and he he, he has given cultural nourishment to the people people's mind which is basically a, the, and satisfied the cultural craving of the chinese chinese middle class and of course then there is all this growth great power projection and scientific achievements etc so so far he is fairly successful in creating an ambiance a political ideological ambiance that is basically sustaining his innings as a and and supporting and reinforcing his innings as a party leader and that will i think continue in the third term also 
but there are challenges of course there will be there are challenges that that he has to re-energize the economy the, the recent contradictions have developed in, in, in economy he has to basically make this dual recon dual circulation theory that increase the the that decouple the the increase the domestic consumption and insulate it from the external economic upheavals and uh, upheavals and so these are so this is this he has to do in the in the th third term more vigorously and seriously because now that is the objective we know but how it will be achieved we don't know much about it and the some of the the policies which have been taken recently per, per, with basically, which basically has impacted private sector and the share of private sector in Chinese economy basically are somehow contradicting in this theory but we hope that they, they will do some uh, something about and in the present scenario it it looks that perhaps there will be greater state control in the economy a greater state control on the in the economy but whether that will benefit china in economy that we will have to see because the symptom is now is is, is that only and i am not very pessimist, pessimistic about the exit from the zero this this zero covid policy because see, there have been many scientific reasons which we have not discussed maybe discuss in the question under sensor as answer session and there may there, there may be political considerations also there is, there is no doubt about that but this zero covid policy is not a badge of honor that china will go on wearing it for many many years <laughs> they have to come out and they and it uh, they may not come out immediately after the 20th party congress but they will come out fairly soon and and when they decide to come out of it they will do it very fast i am pretty sure about it about their but their real challenges are in economy now the handling of the crisis in real estate and banking sectors and of course they have to reinforce the belt, belt and, and road, road initiative because there are lots of uh, issues on its economic side and also on political sides have resurfaced in the last two or three years they have to uh, address all those and when it comes to the for foreign policy i have a slightly different different take and not necessarily because some way i agree with most of the points by previous speakers but i'm just saying in my own words that now the for the immediate challenge for xi jinping and his new team will be to revitalize chinese diplomacy because it has taken a hit like any other countries due to covid 19 and president xi jinping has started traveling internationally again recently he traveled to kazakhstan and he will take up many more visits in times to come i i believe so revitalizing, revitalizing Chinese diplomacy in terms of basically winning trust again in many parts of the world and deepening trust in other many other parts of the world it will be their it will be their priority and managing if now now we should not use the word managing basically salvaging relations with the U.S. is also a top priority and uh, and. This this remains the priority for the both sides. How to salvage the relationship? Let's be, let's not get too obsessed with the coming confrontation with them because things don't happen like the, that way. Both are great industrialist power, nuclear powers, and they don't have stakes in in war. So certainly, I do. If if something happens that defines common sense and rationality, that is a different thing. But in a normal course, as I can visualize things rationally. That kind of situation, I don't think will uh, will come. Relations will be salvaged. It process may be torturous. It may take some years. So the priority will remain that. And in the meantime, the priority will also be to decouple. It's not decoupling is, a, uh, is only happening on American side. The China, China has also this goal to decouple its economy from, from, from the US to the extent that it, it does not have to bear any uh, unwarranted implications of uh, if sanctions happen or whatever this negative situation has emerged in their relationship. And this Russian dilemma has been, I think, should be addressed a bit, a bit more. The, the, so the leadership. One more minute. Yeah, I will finish it in one minute. A Russian dilemma is, of course, there. A Russian dilemma in the sense uh, China, of course, does not want a fatally weakened or fatally defeated Russia. That, that, and many other countries don't want. It's not about China. So China doesn't want, but at the same time, this that is sky is the limit cooperation. That's also a, sky is the limit for the cooperation between the two countries. That is also a cliche. It also do not want to drag into the 
this uh, this uh, r- 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 russian war so how to be, how will they handle this dilemma we have to we will see in coming a uh, period and then china uh, under i think that another priority will be to rebuild rebuild bridges with europe and european european countries and buying peace with some some major major countries maybe india japan and uh, i think overall in the third term we will be witnessing toning down of course as i said that that the and other speakers have also mentioned the as china will be more inward looking and it will be handling the internal problems a bit more particularly with re- reference to the economy so the focus will be there and in the end i also in that i will take it further that that gives a context to, for me to say that china will tone down its wolf, wolf warrior diplomacy so we may witness toning down of wolf warrior diplomacy in in coming years post uh, 20th uh, congress taiwan pot will kept will be kept boiling the outlook will not change and nobody expects that the outlook will will change and i also do not agree that in 2027 something major is going to happen because so many timelines and that uh, taiwan is essential for the realization of chinese dream and that th- therefore it has to be time tabled etc it is all scholarly interpretations and scholarly spins xi jinping himself has not said it i do <laughs> and um, so that, that that is my point and finally what challenges i see and the the last point i i will make that the third term is going to be very critical Uh, critical in the sense now president xi jinping has to decide what he wants he want whether he wants a fourth term so in that case he will have to become more more assertive more powerful or using the word because the western world is there more authority more authoritarian and he will have to li- deliver more if he wants a fourth term and then if he does not want then he will need to think about successor and he will need greater reassurances for his personal safety and secure, uh, security if he wishes to step, step down considering the hardline position and do you know the context why i am saying making this in this point so this uh, third term is going to be very, very critical and in this third term we may so the xi jinping's position at the top at the top elite leadership is pretty sure and uh, pretty safe there is no challenge but i think the second rung leadership will be more anxious Uh, expecting that there will be power change of guard in 2027 so some something with reference to like some sort of laxity and some some uh, something might might happen in in the governance uh, in the party in the, in, in the uh, in the third term and it will all depend on whether xi jinping wants a fourth term or not so therefore i am saying it's a very 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 critical point uh, point in chinese history more than this the 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 ongoing sec- second term and also we need to be watchful towards party and corporate uh, corporate corporate relationship the party's relationship with the uh, with the super rich because the party still wants to deliver wants uh, prosperity and growth for china and but it has but it uh, historically in last uh, 40 years post reforms it has somewhat ambiguous and complex relationship with the uh, corporate they do not want them to outgrow the party so that the and and maybe partly because of that not entirely because of that but partly because of that we have seen some crackdowns on the big corporate houses etc so on that front what is happening going to happen in the coming period coming years we need to we need to watch and finally i will say that the paradox of confidence and paranoia that we witness in china all the time will continue but with some increased caution with 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 some increased caution so that is basically my whole take on this 20th party congress and more than the 20th party congress what, what lies ahead post 20th party congress thank and you. thank you pramod for inviting me uh, thank you dr prashant kumar singh may i now invite mr chang singh mr chang singh is currently a research fellow at sandu institute of world affairs and a non resident research fellow at liaoning university research base for the network of china japan korea trade cooperation of think tanks previously he served as a research fellow at the international peace institute nepal and honorary expert advisor for the jeev jeev raj ashrit foundation he is a graduate student in the middle eastern studies program at harvard university he has published many academic journals uh, published at many academic journals in china britain and nepal and 
on the international conferences on economic management and green development at Oxford University. Mr. Chang, over to you. And you also have eight minutes. Please uh, wrap up within time. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Jaswa. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to just like, share some of my observations of uh, the current Chinese politics and the Chinese society. In, and uh, so to overall, like to conclude about uh, like how the, uh, after the 20th Congress, the Chinese policy will be is that I feel like the, the uh, China after the 20th Congress will be like pursuing the great uh, great uh, visions of uh, President Xi Jinping, but meanwhile, like it's going to face large conundrum of the reality, like uh, facing large um, uh, problems. And uh, so, one important thing is that uh, next year is actually the tenth anniversary of uh, the BRI project. You know, it's in two thousand and thirteen that uh, uh, Xi Jinping announced this when he was visiting Kazakhstan. So we would definitely expect next year to see a lot of um, propaganda and uh, public uh, public uh, publicities about the success of the BRI and things like that. And probably China is going to provide uh, provide more like international aid and loans and stuff for uh, to keep the uh, BRI projects going. And that's probably uh, some uh, very important thing for for South Asia as well. But uh, the problem is that. Uh, the Chinese economy this year has been doing, let's say, frankly speaking, it's doing quite bad this year. And uh, uh, be mainly because of uh, the zero COVID policy. And um, well, I think according to the official data of the Chinese Statistics Bureau, you would find that uh, the Chinese economic growth for the last half a year was 2.4%. Uh, and uh, for the second quarter was zero. 0.2% something increase. And if we all are now about how the Chinese official statistic bureau like calculate their data, we would find that um, they normally like put everything they can into this calculation so that the GDP looks larger and a lot of times probably larger than reality. And this time, even with that type of very generous calculation, 0.4 percent of uh, increase for the second quarter is basically means the economy didn't really grow and basically means that probably like the economy like not only didn't grow but also like shrank um, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, as long as the zero covid policy continues i don't expect the chinese economy of doing any well and this year, according to the estimate of a lot of uh, not only scholars in China, but also United States and everywhere, people have the understand. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, probably the overall increase of uh, of Chinese GDP this year probably is like three percent or something, which is lower than the five percent uh, goal of the of the Chinese State Council, and. Uh, probably this year we would see that the Chinese economic growth is lower than United States, uh, which is uh, a quite problematic thing for the perspective of the, of the Chinese because we're a developing country. And uh, if our economic growth is lower than a developed country, United States, that's a very yeah. terrible thing. And uh, it's also causing the market to lose faith in the future development of the, of the Chinese economy. And uh, the thing is that I'm not very optimistic about the Chinese economy in the future several years is because uh, people may argue that the Chinese government can get rid of the, of the uh, zero COVID policy and return to normal, but it's not that easy. And also like if you hurt the confidence of the market, the confidence is very difficult to be earned back to, to, uh, in terms of uh, economics. And very, very important thing is that uh, last uh, three days, for the last uh, three days, every day there is an article on People's Daily talking about that we are going to continue uh, in, in imposing the zero COVID policy. And those uh, three articles, I uh, have three articles for now, those three articles are all like put into the most central part of the People's Daily. And uh, the the pen name of the person written this is basically 
very high level one, which people imagine it's probably like uh, represent the central committee or something like that. And um, many people believe that uh, many people used to expect that after the 20th Congress, maybe the Chinese zero COVID policy is coming to an end. But uh, this time, literally like four days, uh, three, three, four days before the 20th Congress, we see those articles coming out and shows that uh, even after the 20th Congress, China is probably not going to change the zero COVID policy. And that's the economic data of this year would be like quite bad, quite disastrous in terms of looking. And uh, there's only probably less than two months left for this year. And within those two months, we don't expect any sort of uh, concrete change of the zero COVID policy. And thus, um, we don't expect any like getting better of the of the economy within this year. That's uh, uh, the that's the cause of all the problems. So next uh, year, which is the tenth anniversary of the BRI, it is very arguable how much money the Chinese government is able to pull out for those projects overseas, and it is arguable that how much they are willing to do so. They are definitely going to make a lot of. Uh, uh, like propaganda and advertisement about the great success and everything. But uh, in reality, how much money they can pull out to support those overseas projects is very questionable, in my opinion. And the second thing that is very important, uh, also this um, conundrum between vision and reality is going to continue. And another issue would be the Taiwan issue, which many experts have already talked about. I want to stress one thing is that um, the Taiwan issue is very central in the national narrative of China after 49, because it's a continuation of the Chinese civil war. The Taiwan issue was caused initially by the Japanese uh, uh, colonization of Taiwan by the Sino-Japanese war. So that is regarded as the, the, the separation of Taiwan from the mainland was is regarded by the Chinese as a continuation of the so-called 100 years of humiliation. And uh, that gives uh, the Chinese government have like no, no chance of negotiating over the sovereignty or the claimed sovereignty over Taiwan. Uh, I want to quote one thing is that uh, in, in the 80s when uh, Deng Xiaoping met Margaret Thatcher, he told Margaret Thatcher that if we do not take back Hong Kong by 1997, that means our government is nothing different from the Qing dynasty, and our leaders are nothing different from Li Hongzhang, which is a person who signed the treaty to give Hong Kong to, to Britain. And he says, if that's the case, all the Chinese government will stand up and uh, to, to destroy our government and our government should step down. That is the quote of Deng Xiaoping. And I believe that the same mentality, same logic is certainly applied to Taiwan. So that's the, the, the thing that's, uh, so that's an issue that the Chinese probably just cannot, simply cannot compromise on. And we all know that the legitimacy of the Chinese government at this moment is um, not based on like, uh, like a periodical elections only, like, uh, but it's based on the, its performance to increase or to enhance the livelihood of the Chinese people and its ability to defend the sovereignty of China to prevent the so-called 100 years of humiliation from happening again. So that's closely related to the essence of, uh, of the legitimacy and the survival of the regime. And that's uh, something that the Chinese cannot compromise on. And if we know anything about President Xi Jinping, he is certainly a person who wants to write his name into the history books and being remembered for thousands of generations or something like that. That's something that we, probably can all agree on about his personality. And uh, also one very important experience I want to uh, uh, emphasize about Xi Jinping is that um, he served as the governor of uh, Fujian for a long time. And he among, let's say from Mao Zedong to the present, among those like five leaders of China, he is uh, probably the one who spent most time dealing with people from Taiwan because there's a lot of Taiwan merchants in Fujian, there's a lot of um, Fujian-Taiwan uh, connections and uh, track one, track two diplomacy and all of that. So among all of them, he's probably like the person who spent most time with, uh, on the Taiwan issue. 
and he also wants to be written into the history book. And that naturally come to a conclusion that he is the person who wants to unify Taiwan within his terms, which maybe next term will be the term later. We don't know how long he's going to persist. And we don't know, but like at least like one to two. And uh, he is the person who wants to do that. So you can very clearly see that uh, the Chinese foreign policy trend in the future is that within his term, he wants to unify Taiwan. And uh, at, let's say, at all cost. And, but the, the conundrum is that, as I talked about, if the economy is a conundrum. Like right now, the Chinese economy, we do not see it getting improved this year. And uh, it's very arguable how much we can improve in the future. It's arguable, questionable how long uh, the zero COVID policy is going to take. And uh, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of policies that we see the current administration is like enhancing probably didn't get to a favorable result for now. Let's say a lot of Belt and Road uh, projects and things like that. And that shows that uh, we have great region, but a uh, great vision, but the ability of enforcement may need to be improved, let's say this way. And uh, same thing with like related to Taiwan would have that issue is that uh, for the last uh, 10 years, five to 10 years, we do not see like the unification with Taiwan going into like a very fast uh, progress. And actually on the country, um, after the Hong Kong riot of 2019 and uh, also the mass of zero COVID policy right now, those things are causing Taiwan like more reluctant of uh, toward the unification. And that is uh, a, a huge challenge and our uh, economic problems is certainly a challenge. Very, very unsatisfactory living hood of the Chinese people recently is a challenge because we want to, the, 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 the Chinese uh, government certainly wants to uh, maintain stability. But if the most of the people are living in like such a large, like, like such a heavily pressured atmosphere of zero cover policy, it's very difficult to to like let's say stipulate uh very uh, very difficult to 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 in uh, to instigate the sense of um, patriotism or nationalism and to rally the people around the flag it's that would be very difficult to do so and also one other thing that uh, we probably uh, should think about is that uh, the like we all believe that the president xi jinping is certainly like the most uh, um powerful and influential one in the Chinese uh, politics. And there's no rival as uh, all the other experts have already talked about. But the thing is that uh, he does not have rival, but the thing is that he may not be able to exercise all of this influence into practice as we imagine that would be. And a case of that is the Shanghai lockdown. During the Shanghai lockdown, he was trying to like do the zero COVID policy in Shanghai. He sent uh, the, the, the director, the, the, the general sector of Shanghai is uh, very close to him. He also sent the, uh, the deputy uh, premier, uh, which is also very close to him in, in, to Shanghai to like make sure this thing is going. But the problem is that we see that in Shanghai, the local bureaucrats probably just didn't cooperate well. And the thing become disastrous over the two uh, the two months. So that's a case of showing that uh, he has a lot of influence, but may not be exercise it into the practice. And that thing sets question for uh, not only like Belt and Road projects in the future, but also like the uh, issue of Taiwan, the unification issue of Taiwan, and a lot of uh, goals that the Chinese government is going to try to pursue in the future. That's it. I want to share. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tsang, for your remarks. Now we'd like to spend maximum 15 minutes to answer a few of the questions that we have received. We have received lots of questions, but due to time constraint, I'll just raise some of the issues and then each speaker can spend two to three minutes to answer some of those. Uh, like there, we have received lots of questions on what might be 
the three broad objective of the Congress, three major agendas that will highlight that will be highlighted during this Congress, and will there be any change in policy and leadership which has been addressed? Will Xi Jinping further consolidate power, which all of us have said that the answer is yes? Will the Congress lead to a uh, lift in the stringent zero COVID policy? We have received lots of questions on zero COVID policy. We have also received uh, lots of questions whether. Uh, what is the future of Taiwan Strait uh, uh, during the um, third term of Xi Jinping? Uh, lots of question on impact on India and Nepal relations, which has been answered uh, briefly. Similarly, what are the future plan of CCP uh, uh, on, uh, on the ongoing geopolitical changes around the world? Uh, there are also interesting questions like, is CCP still a revolutionary party, revolutionary organization? And uh, is Xi Jinping going to emerge as a more powerful leader in this Congress, which many of the speaker have said yes. And there are some question whether the strength of uh, PLA would be increased, uh, how they would be able to transform. Will uh, Xi Jinping use PLA as a, as a tool for the next five years where he can project himself as the most powerful, uh, because he has already done on the economic front. So maybe uh, the st strategic front would be one sector where Xi Jinping would like to focus and strengthen himself uh, during the uh, third term that will open door for the fourth term. So these are the questions that I have received. Maybe if you want to add something in just two, three minutes, either to request all our participants, uh, panelists. Uh, I'll start with again, uh, Ambassador Asokant and then followed by uh, uh, Dr. Deepak. So uh, Ambassador Kant, over to you. Uh <laughs> well, in two minutes, uh, trying to answer. You know, I uh, had already talked about uh, the main objectives uh, uh, Xi Jinping has uh, with regard to 20th Party Congress. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, quickly, you know, um, highlight uh, three, four of them. Uh, one, of course, you know, uh, in terms of uh, further uh, reinforcement of his centralized leadership, uh, which has been a feature of uh, of you know, uh, CPC during last 10 years. Uh, uh, two, you know, in terms of uh, uh, ideology, being the chief interpreter uh, or ideologue in chief of uh, Marxism uh, in, in China today. And this will get reflected in uh, changes in the party constitution. Uh, three, uh, in terms of his uh, domestic agenda, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there'll be continuity in terms of domestic and external agenda, uh, but uh, there'll be fresh emphasis on uh, areas like uh, common prosperity, uh, global security initiative, global development initiative, uh, our national security agenda. So I think it will be more a case of uh, uh, continuity with some change in emphasis. Uh, this is first point. Uh, second point, you know, with regard to zero COVID policy, uh, you no, know, it has done a lot of you know, damage, as Mr. Changsheng also uh, pointed out. Uh, it will be difficult for uh, uh, China to get out of zero COVID policy in a hurry for a number of reasons. As uh, you know, Mr. Changsheng mentioned, last three year days, in fact, uh, People's Daily has carried uh, commentaries uh, essentially reaffirming zero COVID policy. So they are uh, partly caught in the narrative trap where zero COVID policy is shown as uh, uh, an illustration of uh, its, you know, the superiority of Chinese system over Western system. Uh, so because they could manage to keep uh, death rates uh, very low in China. But if you open up uh, a number of objective reasons why uh, death rates will go up, uh, very substantially. And that's the risk which will be very difficult for China to take at this point of time. So I suspect that zero COVID policy will continue for some time. A final point I wanted to make uh, with regard to uh, impact uh, on uh, India-China relations. Uh, I don't expect uh, any significant course correction by China in terms of its approach to India. As you are aware, India-China relations are going through a very rough patch because of number of structural reasons and not only because of clashes in Galwan. Uh, China is adopting uh, an approach uh, unmindful of India's interests, concerns, and 
aspirations, which is unlikely to change anytime soon. There might be some tactical adjustment there are basically to drive a wedge with India and the USA and other Western countries, but no substantive accommodation of our concerns and interests. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, sir. Professor B.R. Deepak, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, it is quite obvious, you know, when uh, uh, the, uh, the legitimacy of the Communist Party uh, uh, by way of uh, uh, economic development is getting eroded. So it is uh, uh, obvious uh, that uh, the politics in command, uh, it will uh, 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 gain traction. And that's exactly what is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, happening. And uh, it could also be uh, built through uh, the sixth resolution where uh, uh, it has been emphasized that there has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, certain deviations uh, during the reform uh, uh, period. And that is uh, also, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 or could be interpreted uh, in this, uh, 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 this way. Second thing is, uh, as far as, uh, you know, PLA is concerned, I think, uh, which is uh, uh, to some, uh, 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 way also related to how Xi Jinping is going to handle uh, Taiwan uh, uh, crisis because uh, uh, it is largely expected that Miaohua and uh, uh, this uh, He Weidong, so they would be, uh, you know, making to the vice uh, chairmanship of the CMC. And these are both from the 31st Army Station, uh, 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 you know, uh, earlier they were commanding this uh, uh, Eastern uh, uh, Theater Command, and both uh, are from the 31st Army, Nanjing Army Station in Fujian. So this is uh, also an indication, perhaps uh, wanting to exert pressure uh, on Taiwan, not necessarily, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, mobilize forces. Uh, but uh, I think slightly uh, different from Changsheng, uh, on Taiwan. I think Taiwan uh, uh, is not a colony, you know, uh, Hong Kong was a colony of the British. So if you uh, talk about the century of humiliation, uh, that won't, uh, uh, I think, fit uh, here as far as uh, 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 Taiwan's unification is concerned. I think uh, if it is uh, uh, for this uh, uh, national rejuvenation uh, campaign, then of course it is uh, justifiable. Uh, but perhaps not, uh, uh, you know, the humiliation. Uh, it is not under anyone's occupation. It is uh, uh, the rival uh, faction which has uh, retreated to Taiwan in the wake of uh, uh, communist victory in uh, Maoland. So you are, uh, you know, quite right that it is uh, unfinished unification of China at that time. So, uh, and as far as COVID is concerned, I agree with most of uh, other panelists that uh, uh, it cannot be there forever. Uh, that is also for sure, but gradually uh, perhaps uh, it, would be, uh, it would be removed. I mean, the restrictions. And of course, as Ambassador Khan said that uh, in Chinese it's called, you know, Chi Hu Nan Xia. Once, you know, you have mounted the tiger, so it's difficult to uh, unmount it, right? But uh, even if, uh, all the restrictions are gone, but, uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, health code and travel code uh, are going to stay there forever because of some other reason. I'll stop here. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Leela Manipodil, over to you, sir. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod, once again. Uh, basically, I would also uh, just talk about that uh, uh, relaxation on the COVID uh, pandemic uh, um, measures, uh, the control measures that China has been taking. Of course, uh, this has been uh, taken as a, as a, as a, um, as a supremacy of the, of the governance system of China over the Western governance system that China has been able to control the COVID pandemic with uh, 
less damage than the Western countries or the other uh, other uh, liberal economies. Uh, they said that uh, they have adopted policies. But um, what I uh, see is that the morbidity rate of that uh, COVID pandemic at this moment is very low. And the vaccination uh, to all is already been achieved in China. And uh, um, that uh, very few uh, incidences of the COVID in a, in a particular geographical region, shutting down all, all uh, uh, businesses and then uh, you know, asking people to uh, keep inside the home and the taking uh, nucleic acid test uh, and the uh, COVID test every day uh, for millions of people um, uh, every day. I think that is uh, too much reactions. And the uh, China, uh, I think it, it is a time to, to uh, uh, gradually relax the COVID-19 policy. It has severely uh, dampened the um, economic uh, interest of, of the country and the globe as well. Not only China, it has the severe impact on economic impact to the countries in periphery and the, throughout the world. Um, uh, China's uh, economic growth as uh, already speakers also mentioned, I also mentioned that is uh, blink at this moment. Uh, this is one of the reasons is that COVID-19 pandemic, the policy China has been adopted. That's why this is a time to rethink about, uh, about uh, that uh, relaxation of the policies gradually. I don't see that uh, go free. Um, Maybe um, they should think about this. Um, although uh, Mr. Zhang mentioned that, Zhang mentioned that the, based on that uh, uh, last uh, a few days, uh, the uh, publicity is uh, coming from the, from the uh, uh, close allies of the uh, political leaderships. There is no uh, any, any uh, possibility of immediate relaxation on the COVID policy. Um, uh, um, one of the participants has asked a question about the um, implications to Nepal on the COVID policy. Um, uh, Nepal has a, um, uh, a large number of uh, projects uh, from supported from China, and also the BRI project is in are not in good progress at this stage, and also the um, including that railway project uh, connectivity railway project, and the, there are large number of Chinese contractors uh, uh, operating in China, and then their performances is also suboptimal. This is all because of the uh, uh, one of the regions, major regions is the, the, the COVID restriction policy China has adopted. That's why if relaxation is uh, uh, done on that COVID policies, the project implementation uh, from China funded project as well as the China contractors involved would be speeded up and then that will uh, uh, improve the overall uh, development activities in Nepal. Second, that China is the second largest source of tourism and the tourism industry, the large number of tourism enterprises are dependent on Chinese tourists. The COVID policy is very strict. COVID policy has a severe implications on the enterprises in Nepal. And the relaxation would be uh, um, would have a boost to the to the tourism entrepreneurs or tourism industry in Nepal, and that will definitely uh, help uh, uh, revive the uh, Nepalese economy uh, uh, that was uh, been suffered from the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, this is about the COVID, and the one more question that was been posted uh, was about the prediction of a railway project connecting China and Nepal. Uh, the, both the countries has recently agreed to uh, conduct a feasibility study, and then that will possibly be completed within uh, 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 within um, within a year of the agreement signed or uh, the agree agreed on last uh, um, October. Uh, sorry, last uh, August. Um, maybe uh, uh, by 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 the mid of twenty twenty third, the feasibility study will be completed, and the project actual completion would depend on the on the uh, basically the Nepali side's uh, interest of of uh, taking this project on a, on a priority basis and the making consensus on within Nepal uh, for this project. If there is a, a political consensus, and the Nepal government is determined to take this project uh, with with very uh, uh, undivided mentality and the uh, and they puts its own resources based on its capability and the six the China support uh, uh, unanimously uh, uh, for for uh, uh, connecting railway linkages um, that uh, definitely would uh, uh, will 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 uh, take a speed and then will be uh, uh, realized uh, not very far away very low because China's capability is 
making that rule, that uh, long railway project is not a big deal for China based on its capability to uh, uh, developing railway network and the, its walls, the largest, almost 40% of the fast uh, railway network has already been won by China and then built by China these days. That's why uh, there's no any, any, any kinds of the doubt I have that if there is a, um, uh, a, a unanimous uh, kinds of the uh, uh, building this uh, connectivity, uh, railway connectivity project, um, and the uh, both sides prepare for uh, implementation of the project in terms of uh, uh, institutional uh, arrangements and uh, resource allocations and the legal and procedural matters if they uh, they agreed on that and then it will be a, a not be a that very far distance project. Um, uh, regarding other uh, particular specific issues, uh, um, the policy, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, new leadership's policy towards Nepal, I don't see any, any big paradigm shift unless and until Nepal makes its position changed. If Nepal's position remains continued and the uh, China's uh, continued support to social economic development of Nepal will be uh, uh, pursued and can be expected from the new leaderships as well. And then there will be a continued uh, uh, dialogue at the highest level and the uh, uh, interactions in multiple levels, in economic, cultural, uh, political, um, educational, people to people level. There is a great prospects of uh, expanding bilateral economic and socioeconomic contacts and relationship. And that will uh, definitely uh, benefit uh, Nepali people for uplifting its, its, their economic status, status. And the, uh, if both sides work together and they remain uh, sensitive on their uh, core interest and the work together for maintaining stability and, uh, um, and the, and the uh, development in the region, uh, that uh, that uh, would uh, bring in benefit to both the countries. Um, uh, the, both the both the leadership will pursue the similar kinds of policy. I think in the in the coming days as well. That will be the common interest and the common aspirations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Doctor Ritu Manitiwari, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to focus on now the party priorities. Uh, uh, in the wake of this Congress. So what is it that they are trying to achieve once the uh, new formation of Politburo and Central Committee is there? Uh, there are three, of course, and everybody has been talking about them. The zero COVID policy, uh, how do you exactly you continue it or you discontinue it? Uh, of course, handling the steep economic challenge that is there and the goal of reunifying with Taiwan. Uh, first, coming to zero COVID policy, um, China's zero COVID policy has been uh, one of the landmark policies of Xi and that that's how he has kind of handled the entire uh, COVID, uh, you know, pandemic time with this kind of narrative. And uh, while much of the rest of the world is returning to a kind of post-pandemic normal, uh, Chinese authorities have uh, intensified their efforts to continue uh, to contain outbreaks with strict measures, etc. And uh, there are reports that more than 70 cities, including Shenzhen and Chengdu, are actually under partial lockdown or full lockdown in certain places in the previous weeks. Uh, she has has reaffirmed uh, to fight against any kind of opposition that dis distorts or doubts uh, or denies his COVID policy. So um, the party may argue after this Congress that uh, China, un unlike other countries, values people's lives more than the economy. And that kind of a narrative is going to perhaps, uh, you know, justify the continuation of zero COVID policy for at least some time. Uh, yes, it is not indefinite, but even if it is not indefinite, there is a foreseeable uh, continuance of zero COVID policy for some time. And that is extremely important, uh, given the fact that economy is actually getting hampered because of that. Second, about Taiwan. Um, she has always favored a hardline uh, approach to relations with Taiwan, uh, particularly when it comes to the relationship with West and on the issue of Taiwan, it has been a very hardline approach. Um, and uh, the way uh, she has uh, spoken about reunification with Taiwan and that it must be fulfilled by 2049, uh, uh, 
there is there is a possibility that that kind of hardline approach is going to be continued um and i i don't see any kind of change there which is why i would say ki, that there is a kind of status quo as regards to china's taiwan policy how does it uh, deal with the the economy which is struggling uh, it is in bad shape road to recovery may be extremely long and the government what what kind of directions do we see government taking post this congress um whatever be the composition uh, government has been indicating that it will roll out uh, stimulus packages i mean the way to recovery is basically premised on the fact that government is going to get in with government intervention in terms of investment so stimulus packages to keep the economy on uh, some sort of road to recovery um, uh along with uh and where in which sectors do these stimulus uh, measures actually go that is what will uh, be very important when it comes to balancing with zero covid policy because there are sectors which are getting extremely impacted due to a lockdown due to zero covid uh, policy so whether these are the ones which are pro people which are rather populist uh, you know segments of um uh, economy that is something that remains to be seen um i'll just rest with uh, uh, the popular chinese phrase which is in usage probably she will abide by that putsu uh, putsi which is like you don't if you don't really very loosely translate it uh, if you don't really quote trouble if you don't go asking for it you will not die so maybe not too much of an upheaval is in the offing uh, maybe stability is the keyword for that so thank you thank you mr mb rapai over to you sir thank you from uh, i think i will not uh, labor on too much on the covid policy but i think it will be slow and steady uh, road back will be there because china we have to understand the the development of chinese urban space because if they allow the 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 covid unless they have um, proof methods it will it can spread and really have havoc among the population so i think uh, i will leave it that but uh, overall economic development the it is two uh, things are there for xi jinping to uh, maintain the economic development because that also related to the aspirations of the people and the satisfaction of the people because that is going to keep the party in power and uh, the dispensation which is going to come uh, in the next uh, after the election Uh, after the uh, the congress who will be ruling the the uh, the party and how much they can deliver that will depend upon it and i will uh, take up the question about pla strength i think to my understanding pla is not going to increase the strength rather they may reduce but it depends upon two or three conditions rather their uh, focus will be on joint warfare and uh, making the theater command system they introduce as success because that needs a lot more joint cooperation between all their different uh, units army navy air force and the rocket forces so that training will take a longer time even though uh, because joinness even with all the experiments in american military we can see joinness takes a longer time the resource Uh, mobilization and resource utilization by different forces needs a lot more training and uh, uh, working together so china will um, uh, see that development but uh, but chinese are certainly doing the pla one thing we can see is the quality improvement and the education level of the forces that how they will manage that because due to the cyber and uh, uh, now uh, the artificial intelligence is going to be more applied into the army that transition how pla is going to manage and uh, where the resources will come how the universities are getting, getting to invo- involved in that process i think that needs uh, a keener uh, attention and uh, on taiwan as i mentioned i don't expect because taiwan is at the same time taiwan is deeply involved in china's Uh, financial system because a lot of um, uh, investments are there uh, even i don't think anybody have the real figures about it uh, and uh, apart from if uh, for example the dpp has their own interest in keeping the um, uh, quarrel going on uh, but how the political dispensation in both countries uh, who will replace the present premier in taiwan the president president in taiwan 
those things will um, will, will have to be watched and uh, i don't even though the people are putting 1927 or 1949 i don't think that is a uh, you know that is that is nothing engraved on a stone because that uh, according to their um, uh, circumstances and convenience that dates can be reworked of course uh, xi jinping cannot argue that he is not for unification any leader sitting there will say that i am for reunification so let us wait and see the developments uh, and uh, le- uh, the the main thing is how the the aspirations of the people getting satisfied that is to be watched thank you uh, thank you sir may i now invite dr prashant kumar sir now i will not speak much because but i have made all my points already i will just simply say that uh, paradigms in domestic politics and society will continue and they will intensify and deepen paradigms in economy will need to be reinvented and improved and i think they will they also realize the urgency and in foreign policy the basic outlooks will not change certainly they will not change but i expect that necessary and important tactical adjustments will be made and it's not that and the situation will force them to do so that's my basic point and about taiwan i would like to make a general point because uh, i will not go into the because i have already said that i do not see as a much threat, any significant threat to taiwan either in 20 27 and i will also say and sorry what is yeah in the 2027 or not not in, i do see that in that way in 2049 so that is my i may time may prove me wrong that's a different matter but i don't know i don't see and the, but a general point is my this where i will recon- try to reconcile professor the uh, sir we are deepak sir and uh, Mr. dr sanchans that i uh, see i cannot basically offer and visualize and i cannot uh, tell a precise way out for both the parties in fact no one can and no one has done so in last 7 70 years or so my general remark is that i think a climbing down from both sides need to happen they need to take place the democrat uh, the, sorry the radical sections in taiwan uh, should also should realize that uh, they cannot abandon denounce or refute their chinese heritage chinese culture uh, cultural roots and historical connect- connections and they just cannot wish away the fact that the problem is the result of the chinese civil war and also the chinese side the particularly the cpc should also be respectful towards taiwan in the sense they should accept that the taiwanese are also a chinese but of different tradition and that tradition should be respected and and and, and keeping this general principle in mind maybe future generations may find some solution to the problem thank you thank you sir and dr bhavana singh uh, thank you dr pramod uh, there was a question on whether the party is still revolutionary i think in one of recent one of his recent speeches xi jinping uh, said we will not walk back the old path of isolation or dogmatism nor shall we ever take the evil path of changing flags which is basically a metaphor for in revolutionary language meaning they will not change the political system so i think by this statement he has uh, given a clear message as to how revolutionary and how uh, how much they are going to stick to the current political system uh, his resolve to achieve uh, the dream of national reju- rejuvenation is stronger but i think uh, uh, the uh, the circumstantially he is bound uh, and so his the tone that he may present in the congress may be milder uh, i'll also uh, uh, point to the fact that uh, they have so far achieved all the targets uh, as far as transforming the pla into a world class military by 2050 is concerned so that is a major plus on his report card when he stands in front of the cpc this uh, in this particular for, uh, cpc congress thank you thank you uh, mr uh, cheng sang yeah i think uh, i agree with uh, what uh, the activist uh, said and the one thing that i want to stress is that uh, a lot of times probably like 
if we look at what is uh, the tragic uh, the, the 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 trajectory of the Chinese decision making this year, a lot of times what we would find that uh, probably the leadership is not making the decision from a purely technical point of view, and the most uh, uh, the the best example is the zero COVID policy, is that we have been reaching the consensus that. Uh, COVID Omicron right now is not like COVID like three years ago. It's a totally different thing. But uh, the thing is that we noticed that the medical experts are not the ones making the Chinese policy toward COVID at this moment. And uh, the, the zero COVID policy is closely linked uh, to the political agenda of the administration. So they're like politicizing this thing and making decisions according to political ideas. That's why if you see that uh, uh, the highest leader Xi Jinping himself made a speech saying that uh, our zero COVID policy is quote unquote, closely related to the very essence of the party. That's his speech. And uh, I have yet find another case of uh, any leader from Mao Zedong to the present linking one policy closely to the essence of the Communist Party. That's unheard of in history. Uh, so that we see that, uh, prob and, and also like right now, the last three articles that we mentioned on People's Daily saying that we have to continue doing this thing. It's like, you wouldn't be able to understand that from a technical point of view, but uh, from a political sense to see that, uh, uh, how like this the the highest leadership is trying to preserve the uh, prestige or in Chinese word we say preserve the face in the, preserve the face of um, uh, and you and, and to make political decisions in order to preserve the face and prestigious and uh, stability of the of the current administration I think that is why the zero COVID policy is right now become like such a huge thing and uh, why it's probably not gonna change. And for the same reason, I would say that we would find in the issue of Taiwan in the future, like within next to five, 10, 10 years, a lot of times you would find uh, this quite similar thing is that a lot of times today, I think we're discussing from technical point of, uh, point of view to see like the benefits waiting against the cost and things like that. But it seems like that may not be the path that the Chinese leadership may take in the at this moment and may in the foreseeable future, because the they will probably like not to see that from a strict benefit versus cost calculation. They may see that from a more of perspective of um, preservation of uh, legitimacy, prestige, and face, and uh, uh, personal reputation, and things like that. So that's what uh, uh, the, the so-called irrational, I mean, I don't want to use this word irrational because it's not, it's very rational, but like, uh, but like there's uh, like a sort of like emotional, personal factors, and the uh, uh, click factors, those things might worth more and may have more influence to then uh, to Chinese foreign policy in the future than we probably like as think it deserves at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Asok Kant, Professor B.R. Deepak, Ambassador Lilamani Podel, Dr. Ritu Samani Tiwari, Mr. M.B. Rapai, Dr. Prasant Kumar Singh, Dr. Bhavna Singh, Mr. Sen Sang. We're really thankful for the interesting remarks and a valuable time. I on behalf of NICE, would like to express our gratitude for your remarkable presentation and, we'd, and, and, and your love and support provided to NICE. We hope to have you again in the future, maybe right after the National Congress to analyze how uh, things are moving beyond that. We'd also like to thank all the participants who joined us through Zoom, Facebook, Live and YouTube. I would also like to thank you all for the questions. We have next two events, Growing Complexities of India-China Relations, on 17th October, and another on regional security of South and Southeast Asia by Lieutenant General Daniel Leaf, who is former commander of US Indo-Pacific Command and former director of APCSS Hawaii, which is on 17th October. Thank you all and see you soon. Thank you.